Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. It's 10 a.m. and you won't sell me a McChicken because lunch starts at 11? I work at a pretty well-known fast food establishment, and we get all kinds of entitled people all the time. This was the most memorable. So at the place I work, we only sell breakfast items until 11. This lady pulls up to order at around 10.30. Me. Thank you for choosing Mick You Know The Place. What can I get for you? Karen. Yeah. Can I get a McChicken? Me. Sorry. Unfortunately, we don't start serving lunch until 11 today. Is there anything else I can get for you? Karen. Yeah. A McChicken. It's only 30 minutes. You can just make it for me. Me. I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to sell any lunch items until 11 exactly. We do have breakfast items with chicken in it, if you'd like. Karen. See? You just told me you had chicken. Now make me the sandwich. Me. Unfortunately, I cannot do that. She then drives up to the last window and demands to speak to my manager. So I go get her so she can just tell her the exact same thing. Karen. This jerk won't let me have my McChicken, and I'm in a hurry, so if you could please... Manager, excuse me, but we don't start lunch till 11, and I'm not going to pull out lunch items early just for you. So if you're not going to order, please pull through. Thank you. That's it. That's all she says and walks away. She never argues with customers, just tells them how it is. I then ask her if she'd like anything else, and she rolls her eyes. Yeah, I'm going to sit here till I get my food. So I tell my manager, and she's visibly irritated. She goes back to the window and tells her if she didn't move, she'd be forced to call the police. This is where things go south. You can't do that. I'm a paying customer. I have a right to be here. Get me my darn food. Now! My manager doesn't say anything, just walks away. She then begins honking and continues to yell. She grabs the phone and walks back to the window so the lady could see. She dials three random numbers and pretends to call the police. Karen. You're lying. You wouldn't do that to a paying customer. My manager ignores her and acts like they picked up the phone. Manager. Yes, there's a lady in the drive-thru and she's harassing my employees. And that was all it took for this lady to speed off. I will never get why people get so mad over food. Speaking of food, what's your favorite fast food place? Please leave a comment right now letting me know. Next we've got, Karen recognizes me from a job I stopped working at over a year ago. One day after work, I stopped by the local pet superstore where all the pets go in order to get some more litter for my two cats. This particular location has a station where you can refill your own jugs with the store brand litter at a discount if you buy one of their containers first. I have Maine Coon mixes, so I buy in bulk when I can and had three empty jugs in my cart and a fourth in my hand that I was refilling with litter. It's at this point that I hear a woman clear her throat. It was cold season, so a lot of people were doing that, and became vaguely aware of an older woman getting closer to me. I just moved closer to the bin so she could pass behind me if she needed to, finish up with the first jug, and move on to the second. This was apparently the wrong thing to do, as the woman huffs at me. Where are the poop scoops? I stop what I'm doing and glance around, thinking that maybe she had spoken to an employee that was stocking shelves or something. But no, she's scowling right at me. It was early in the afternoon in the middle of the week, so there weren't many employees in the store yet. Whatever, no big deal. I have a vague idea of where things are since they remodeled the store. I take a second to glance down the aisle I'm standing next to and am relieved to see litter boxes. I reflexively give her a customer service smile and gesture down the aisle. They're at the end of this aisle, against the wall. Karen doesn't bother to thank me as she moves closer to the aisle and looks down it before huffing again. Those ones are too small. 
I need a big one. I realize at this point, she means the dog shovel scoop things. I shrug and move on to my third litter container. Well, I only have cats, so I don't know where the dog stuff is now that they remodeled the store. You should probably ask an employee. But you're an employee. I see you here all the time. I should probably point out that I work in an office and was dressed in black trousers, heels, and a green patterned blouse with a small purse hanging off the shoulder facing Karen. The employees here wear sneakers, jeans, and either a red or blue t-shirt with the company name and logo in big white letters on the front and back of the t-shirt. I have two large cats, so they go through litter pretty fast, so I'm here on an almost weekly basis, but I don't work here. That's a lie. You gave my dog a bath, and I've seen you on the registers. It's at this point I'm a little shocked. I had worked in the grooming salon of this particular store for a couple of months, but that was well over a year ago. I'm sorry, I should clarify. I haven't worked for this company in over a year. They've remodeled the store since I was an employee, so I really don't know where they moved the dog shovels to. I believe they were at the front of the store when I worked here, but that area is now where they have the dog food. I finally see an employee approaching, probably drawn to Karen's steadily rising voice, and point him out to Karen, who promptly stomps over to him to complain. I had finished refilling my jugs, so I pushed my cart towards the registers, only catching part of Karen's complaints about my poor customer service before I tuned the rest out. Funny thing is, I would have helped her find where it had been moved to if she hadn't started talking to me like I was beneath her. Just because you're old, it doesn't give you the right to toss basic manners to the dogs. Are you team dogs or team cats? Please leave a comment letting me know and we'll see who wins. Next we've got... Oh, your name's not Karen? Not my problem. So for background, I grew up in the hospitality industry with my parents, who, to those behind the scenes, shared the power of a general manager authority. Although my dad was the one who holds that position, has for over 10 years now. I'm talking a total power couple, even though, yes, they had and still have their arguments just like any other couple, with my dad handling the money, numbers, etc., essentially the business side, and my mother handling the social aspect or the employees slash guests. My mother is known widely throughout the hotel for no reason, or if you don't have a reason for not working, that I'm not taking your crap. You'd be surprised how often housekeepers just refuse to show up and work. But my father, on the other hand, is seen as the much more reasonable one. To a point, at least. I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen him livid enough to the point of yelling where the hotel is concerned. Seeing as some of my earliest memories of the hotel rooms, front desks, and the general drama that happens behind the scenes, you'd think I'd be immune, or at least tolerant to crap. But that's another story for another day. As I said, I grew up in this business and helped out a lot taking shifts occasionally, and running errands for whichever of my parents were on shift. But I never actually got paid the same as the other employees. By that, I mean my parents paid me from their own pay, which is fine. I hardly did the same amount of work they did in the same amount of time, which meant I wasn't on the payroll. Therefore, I wasn't technically an employee. Remember that, one of the few pieces that will come to play out in my favor. Okay. I also have to mention that my parents have managed more than one hotel in my lifetime, and for the past several years, the common thing is for them to live in the hotel they manage, given it's in a completely different state than their house. My house now, thank you. So they have their own room. I can access it when I'm visiting, because when I'm there, I pitch in and help out, which commonly requires me to have a master key. Yes, one that opens all the doors. They really don't look that much different from the guest keys, except for the markings or when the housekeepers wear them on lanyards and the regular guest keys don't work after noon, which is the time you must be checked out or you'll be charged for another day. One more piece to remember. There are five floors in total, but technically the second floor is where guests can use a side door to access the parking lot and their rooms without going all the way from the lobby. It requires an active key card to work from outside. Another piece. I don't tell anyone else this, and typically only a few staff members are aware of who I am anyways, the manager's daughter, so it's not really obvious. On my last visit, I was given a master key the day after I got there and was told they'd call me if they needed my help. I'm typically an introvert and stay in my room playing video games and reading, 
sometimes wandering out to spend time with my parents, wearing jeans and a graphic tank top and flannel. Nothing like what the clerks or employees should wear. I left my room with a book in hand, my phone and master key in my pockets, but you could really only see the outline of my phone, another piece to come into play. This is where the background truly ends and the story begins. I was going to head down to the lobby with my book and sit on the couches to read, to hang out, when my mother on her shift, she's a bookworm too, so we tend to read in silence together, when as soon as my door closed, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I could feel a disturbance in the force. Lo and behold, from behind me I hear the sound of a wild Karen. Excuse me? My first thought was, oh boy. My second thought was, how fast can I annoy her? Yeah, I'm an introvert, but that doesn't mean I am uncomfortable with drama or people. I just prefer to hibernate in the comfort of my living space. Big difference. In fact, on occasion, when confronted with, well, confrontation, I find I enjoy myself when I annoy them. I mean, I didn't ask for you to bother me, so that's your problem. I digress. This lady is what I classify as your stereotypical Karen. Seems put together on the outside, but on the inside is just a storm of entitlement and lack of empathy. I won't describe what she looks like, because then people from the hotel would know exactly who she is. Anyways, I turned to face her, where I had just been about to step away from my room door, replying with, You're excused, which I know for a fact tends to take people off. But to be fair, it's what one is supposed to say at one's dinner table in response. Yeah, we're not at a dinner table, but still. You need to help me, right now. My third thought is, now where have I heard that one before? Oh right, this is Karen. No I don't, I'm just trying to go to the lobby. Oh no you're not, you're going to help me. Okay, this is where I realized that I had two major options. A. Get mad and lower myself to her level, or... B. Ride this out to the perfect, I don't work here lady moment. While option A was tempting, I decided that I could hold off on reading for now. Fine. What do you need help with? Well, you need to start doing your job and bring my bags out to my car. Whoa, hold up. The hotel employees do not do that. We weren't that big of a building or business to warrant bellboys, and we had luggage carts and elevators for that particular reason. As far as I know, Guests tended to understand that, until now. <laughs> fine. You know what? I'll go along with it. So I head with Karen to her room, which was four doors down from mine, and she shoves this large suitcase, I'm talking everything but the kitchen sink large, into my hands and carries this tiny bag instead. The suitcase does have a handle, but when I reach for it, Karen snaps at me. No, I said to carry it out. No, you didn't. Karen gaped at me for a moment before replying with, Yes, I did, and do your job, and do not talk back to me. I'm a guest. So Karen is striding ahead of me by a few paces while I am somewhat struggling to carry this large suitcase, and by the time I get to the elevator, Karen is already standing beside it, where I set the bag down for a moment to catch my breath, because that was pretty much my exercise for the week. Hurry up, or you're fired. Karen hops into the elevator, and by the time I'm able to pick up her suitcase, she's already heading down. So on the stairs, I simply push her suitcase down each flight, hoping that I'm already smashing a few breakables in the process. Yes, I was petty. Don't care. Karen is already out the side door by the time I reach the bottom with her suitcase. She didn't even notice that it had hit the bottom somewhat loudly. Before I pick it up, I check the time on my phone. 1.36 p.m. Karen was surely about to be charged for another day, or had already been. She hadn't been out of her room long enough to have met the 12 noon deadline, obviously. Therefore, her card would not work. Ah, karma. You show up just when I need you. So I walk over to the door with her suitcase in hand and open it, nearly throwing it out the door, and Karen screeches when I do. You can't do that. I'm going to have your job for that, you useless jerk. So, not really mad. I stare at Karen, seeing her rage beginning to rise, when I don't start begging for forgiveness and simply say, you can't really take what I don't have to begin with. What? What do you mean? I take a small step back from the door, but I keep my body kind of leaned forward with my eyes locked on hers so she doesn't notice the moment. 
I would have called her Lady in this next part if she hadn't yelled at me and called me names and useless. I don't work here, Karen. Thanks for staying. I say in a falsely cheery voice before I slam the door shut with all my might. The electronic lock clicks into place, thus leaving her outside. Did I forget to mention that she still had things in her room? Well, yeah, she was charged for another day and even told my mother about the rude bellboy. I'm a girl and present as one, locking her out. My mother tried to explain to her that since she wasn't checked out or out of the room after 12, then she would be charged for another day and that her key card was only programmed for the night she had paid for. Oh, and that we don't have bellboys. Karen eventually got her stuff, but still had to pay and didn't get her security deposit back since she had apparently damaged the doorframe to her room. All in all, Bellboy 1 and Wild Karen 0. Next we've got, Boss blocks my promotion, I block his job. For background, I work in a very competitive part of the service industry. It's a large enough community, but at the same time, it's small enough where someone somewhere in the industry knows you, so it's important to not burn bridges as one day you may find yourself in a disadvantageous position. I was in my position for a good three years as middle management. No call outs, never late, always stayed after to help my team out, worked on projects that belonged to my bosses, etc. Except for one day, which I had gotten in a car accident. I was working the night shift and it was raining, this is important later in the story, and was unable to go into work as my car was undrivable and I had to wait for a tow truck insurance and trying to find a ride late at night slash early morning was very difficult. At the time, my director had been let go and there was a battle to see who would get his promotion. For hierarchy purposes, it's my director, my direct bosses all on the same level of authority, three of them, then me. One of the direct bosses, let's call him Jerk, decided he was getting the promotion and started shaking our department, restructuring projects, changing people's shifts, taking credit for other people's work. He was a real pain. About a few weeks of this, he had decided to switch me from morning shifts, which I had gotten due to my seniority in the team, into night shifts. I didn't make a stink because we were very shorthanded, also important, and the team needed help as we had newer members who had kids and I understood how this could affect their life. Fast forward a few more weeks and I get into the car accident which made me call out. This didn't sit well with him as I had made the team suffer because of my irresponsibility. What? And I didn't think much of it since I knew it was stressful and people tend to say things they don't mean under stress. Soon after that, I met some higher ups from another department. They offered me a job in a new venture the business was exploring. I was a good candidate because of my experience and work traits. Of course I agreed as this would be a promotion in position and salary. Plus my network of contacts would put me in a position to grow even further. I went through a series of interviews, three in total and I was given the opportunity to take the position. I signed my paperwork and shook the hand. A couple of days later, HR called me saying the position was rescinded and that it shouldn't come as a surprise. I was shocked and asked for a meeting to understand the decision. Cue the day of the meeting. I walked in and HR is sitting in the meeting room with Jerk. After the cordialities, Jerk explains that he blocked my promotion because I had attendance issues, which I had one call out due to my accident. And HR chimed in saying this shouldn't deter me from applying again in six months. Okay. I accepted defeat because I still needed my job and I didn't want to paint a target on my back. A couple of days later, a friend of mine that worked close to Jerk had told me Jerk had made the comment that he didn't want to let me go because I would leave the night shift uncovered and no one would easily accept that shift. I was furious but decided to not act on it as I explained earlier it's a small enough business. A few months later, the competition opened up close enough that a few people left to go there. I was one of them. I was hired by an amazing boss who I am still friends with years after. He offered me a great position and a huge raise in salary. For hierarchy purposes, it was my boss, then me, and my counterpart, then our assistants. I had heard through the grapevine that Jerk had gotten rejected from the director position and was leaving the company. About a week or so later, I was looking at new hires with my boss to fill out my counterpart position. My boss calls me and says, Hey look, this guy comes from the company you came from. To my delight, I saw Jerk's name. I had been hiring people to the assistant positions from previous company, so I guess Jerk thought he was next. 
I told my boss the story about Jerk and how he blocked my promotion. All my boss said was, thank you, but no thank you. We didn't even give him an interview. Looking back at it, we should have given him the interview and just said no. It would have made it sweeter. Like I said before, don't burn bridges if your industry is small. Next we've got, I want that $200 item for $50. While the topic of Karens is on my mind, I'll tell my biggest Karen story so far. The whole thing took place a few months ago when I was working an evening shift. While I'm on register, Karen comes up with a few items. This Karen is probably in her 50s with dyed black hair and eyes that hate the world. I'm processing her items as she asks, Hey, do you think that piece of furniture out there will fit in my vehicle? It's that black one out there with the drawers. I drive an Arcadia. Now that's just so helpful. There's over a hundred pieces of furniture out there, and at least 20 are black, and more than one have drawers. It doesn't help that I had a pillar and other furniture obstructing my view, and I cannot leave my register when I'm signed on, or when a transaction is in progress. So, not knowing the dimensions of the furniture, and not knowing what the heck an Arcadia is, I just decide to be safe, and say that I personally do not know if the piece would fit in her vehicle, and explain why. She's not happy with my answer, and she huffs. She sees one of my managers walk by and says, Oh, well he looks like he would know. I admittedly freeze and repeat what I said. Yes, I know I messed up in that moment, but I don't feel nearly as bad, considering the rest of the story. I don't remember what form of payment she used for this transaction, but I'm fairly certain it wasn't a check. I leave my register to work on some other projects, since the lines are pretty non-existent in that moment, but I notice that Karen is still shopping at the front. Must have put her bags in the vehicle, and she's doing some more shopping. 20 minutes later, I get called up to the front for a furniture carryout. And sure enough, when I get up there, Karen is buying that piece of furniture with a check. I stand near the register, waiting and ensuring the payment of about $180 or so was actually given. And then I let Karen point me to which piece it was. It's, at most, a one and a half foot by five foot cabinet of drawers on wheels. Pretty small. I don't even need my two-wheeler, so I leave it behind. I ask Karen to pull her vehicle up to the doors and I'll load the piece into her vehicle. She pulls out, I wheel the piece out, and as I'm lifting it up, she suddenly says, It's cracked! I pause and look closely, and yeah, it is. It's a thin, inch and a half long streak in the wood where it must have been warped or messed up somehow. Considering it has a blemish and her reaction, I set the piece down and ask, I take it you don't want it anymore? And she just says, Well, of course not. It's cracked. It's defective. It's broken. It shouldn't have even been on the floor in the first place. Do you guys not have any kind of quality control here? We head back inside to the register where she purchased the item. Now, policy states that we cannot do refunds for check purchases within 10 days of the purchase. This is done to allow the banks enough time to process the check. The cashier states this. Karen gets upset. The cashier calls for a manager. The assistant manager shows up. Karen is still upset. Assistant manager is still pretty new at the whole assistant manager thing, and so she calls the store manager up. This is where it gets fun. Karen's ranting about quality control and the blemish and says she would only pay $50 for it at most. Remember, this piece was sold to her for $180, which is already a 30% discount of the original price. And she's saying a small scratch on the side of the piece justifies it being marked down that much. She says she wants it for $50 or she wants her check back. When she says this, the cashier and I just look wide-eyed at each other, silently saying, Is she serious? There's no way store manager is going to let that slide. And sure enough, he didn't. I was walking away to work on other stuff since I wasn't needed, but I still heard store manager being short with Karen, making a one-time exception and giving her check back after he saw her ID to ensure it was actually her. Apparently, she called the store the next day to complain some more, saying she waited 45 minutes before someone showed up to help get the furniture out to her car. Ha, <laughs> no. I was right there waiting for the transaction to complete. Store manager even confirmed that on the security cameras. And the best part? A different customer bought the same piece of furniture for the $180 later that week. Had no issues with it. Do people not have anything better to do with their lives? Do you think Karen was being too picky with the furniture? Or do you think she was right to refuse it? Please leave a comment letting me know.
I pretended to be a manager to save a cashier. So, I'm 24, 22 at the time, and I worked as a station agent in a French airport. Those are the people in suit that check you and your luggage in and even board you or deboard you from planes. I worked with a French company for eight months during the summer of 2018. Working there was the best. Great hours, big pay, people are jerks, but honestly, not so bad once you learn how to deal with them properly. One of my favorite parts of this job were the hours, either from 4 a.m. to 2 p.m. or from 1 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. No weekends, nor public holidays. For most people, that's probably bad, but for me, it was paradise. We would get days off by cycle, and having days off in the middle of the week rocks. Go get groceries with almost nobody in stores, all government agencies open, and less people all around because they are working. A paradise. Now, for the five first months there, I would always come dressed in a suit, full suit, even in the middle of summer, with a tie and everything. So I would go home or stop to stores in the suit as well. After a while, I got tired and started to change clothes arriving and leaving from work. This story of course happened when I was still coming and leaving from work in a full suit. It was around three months after I started. By then, wearing a suit became neutral. No more of that weird, uncomfortable feeling while wearing it. It became normal. Even more, I got used to changing my attitude while wearing it like my posture and people, even in the streets, would think that I am some successful person just because I wear a suit. And I also got quite used to noticing people needing help, problematic customers and all that. I leave work at 3 or 4 p.m., had to stay longer to cover for someone, and head to a store to bring a faulty electronic I bought there. I walk to the store, wearing only my suit, and carrying the thing in a bag. I head toward customer service and immediately notice a man, hand on the counter, leaning toward the cashier. She'll be Julie, and all her colleagues look tense, eyeing the guy. I shrug. Not my problem. I'm not paid to deal with that one. I turn to sit and notice that all the seats are taken, so I stay up and pull out my phone. Meanwhile, this guy starts to speak louder and louder. From what I got, the issue was that he wanted to use the store card of his wife, but the store policy is that you can't use the card of another customer, even if you're their relative, as the card can be used to make credit. The guy gets more and more heated up and starts calling around for other people to join. That immediately ticks me off. When I was in training to become a station agent, we learned of different types of customers. I won't go into detail, but this guy is what we call a red customer, someone that will rally others to help them get what they want. I see Julie on the verge of tears and I try to think of something to do while the guy starts yelling at her. I finally notice a paper hanging near the counter and take action. I drop my bag, adjust my tie, take my best manager face and walk over to the guy. As soon as he notices me, he smirks and turns to me. You're the manager? To which I reply, yes, while looking at both him and the cashier, as if to judge the situation. Julie turns white. He points at her and says, This employee is discriminating against me. I want to use a discount on my wife's store card. I have her ID. There's no reason that... I then take a step forward. I'm not tall and this guy is taller than me, but he still stops while I get into his face. Without a word, I point at the paper I saw earlier. It's a notice saying that any kind of harassment or insults towards an employee will result in a lawsuit and fine for the customer. It's his time to turn white, or whiter. He opens his mouth, but I'm faster. She is right. If you want to use that card, you need your wife to be here. Now I have to ask you to leave, or I'll have to call security. But first, you will apologize. You've been beyond insulting to her. A security guard that is always near steps closer. He turns to the woman, apologizes in a weak voice, and quickly walks off. I walk to Julie and ask if she's okay. She thanks me profusely. Then another worker comes to me and asks me what to do with a product returned by another client. I giggle and pulling my airport ID simply state, Sorry, I don't work here. I just can't stand people like this. I was allowed to pass first, got a refund, and smiles from everyone on the team. A good day. Would you ever pretend to be a manager to help out a cashier in need? Please let me know in the comments. Next we've got, Entitled Mom Wants to Delete a Zombie Game from My Phone. Cast. We've got me. We've got Entitled Mom. We've got Nice Kid. We've got My Mom and My Dad. 
the one who arrested the entitled mom. Background. So me, my mom, and siblings went to New Orleans to visit family for Thanksgiving. So we land at the second airport with no problem, and we had like a three-hour layover time. So we found the gate we were at, which took 30 minutes. So my mom went to go get food with my siblings and left me with the stuff. So I did what any normal person would do and just chilled and played a game on my phone. I was playing Last Day on Earth, so I will look back for my mom and she wasn't there. But Nice Kid was there watching. He's about my age, which is 15. Me jumps a bit. Oh, hey, Nice Kid. Hey, sorry I can't help, but notice the game on your phone. What's it about? Me. Well, it's about the zombies. Oh, cool. So I keep playing and telling Nice Kid about it, but I guess when I started taking out the zombies, I hear this. Entitled Mom. <gasps> what is that awful game? Me. What do you mean, lady? That game that you're playing. Oh, what's wrong with it? It has blood in it. So what? That game made you violent, and it will do the same thing to my son. Now hand over the phone so I can delete that horrible game. Nice kid. Mom, please don't do this again. Entitled Mom. It's for your own good, sweetie. Me. Wait, she's done this before? Nice kid. Yeah. That's none of your business. Now hand over the phone. Me. No, it's my property. Entitled Mom, now shouting. You need to respect your elders, young man. Now my mom has come back. My mom. He does respect his elders. How would you know this? Because he's my son. Fast forward an hour and 30 minutes later. It's time to board, and fate would have it, I got sat next to the entitled mom and nice kid. Now I have ADHD, which is where I can't sit still for long periods of time, so I start bouncing my leg. Nice kid. ADHD, I'm guessing? Me. Yeah. Entitled mom. Shut up, you two. I'm trying to get my sleep. So nice kid's mom fell asleep, and nice kid starts telling me that his mom thinks these kinds of games make people violent. Nice kid. The reason why she did that is because she thought it would make me violent. Me. Oh, but why were you watching? You're about my age. Nice kid. My mom forbids my phone or anything at her house. That's why I'm hoping my dad gets full custody of me. My dad likes the same stuff I do, so I just leave my stuff at his place. Me. Oh man, I'm sorry your mom's like that. Thanks, man. So I had fallen asleep at this point and I woke up to nice kid holding my phone with his mom telling him to give it. Me. What's this about? Nice kid. She tried taking your phone. Me. Oh, thanks for grabbing it. Now we had landed and into the airport. Now my dad had picked up an extra duty shift and he had some free time. So he came to see us when we landed. That's when Karen gets off the plane and she slapped me and pushed me to the ground. That's for not giving me the phone. Thud. Entitled mom. I'll have your badge for this. My dad. You just assaulted someone. I'm in full legal rights to do this. Me. Explains what's happened. She tried to take my phone, dad. Entitled mom. Complete jerk face. Wait. Dad? My dad. That's right. Now explains the court of law talk. As for me and the kid, we're now good friends. We go to the same high school. And his dad won full custody of him after this incident. So for entitled mom, she got a month in jail and community service hours. I hope you all enjoyed reading previous and new. What games do you play on your phone? Please let me know right now in the comments. Next we've got Actor's Mom Angry That The Box Office Is Not Open 45 Minutes Early So when I was in college, I worked at my school's theater as a seamstress. Another former grad and I decided to go to Homecoming, which also had a play in the theater scheduled after the game. So we decided to stay and say hi to those that were still there, as well as see the show. We had a long time to wait, so we decided just to chill in the lobby for a couple of hours, waiting till the play started. About 45 minutes before box office even opened, the entitled mother came in. Cast of characters is me. We've got my theater friend. We've got entitled mother, and B is my former boss and one of the faculty that runs the theater. Another note is that Entitled Mom has a super high-pitched voice. Think a girl version of Alvin and the Chipmunks. Entitled Mom walks into the lobby and notices that the box office is obviously closed, then walks over to us, just laying on the couches relaxing. Entitled Mom. Excuse me, but when does the box office open? 
friend. As the sign states, it does not open for another 45 minutes. If you're looking for information, we might be able to help. What do you need? We used to work for the theater when we were students. Entitled Mom. I just came to get my tickets I reserved over the phone, but the person refused to confirm whether I got the seats I wanted. Friend. Well, sometimes reservations take a while to go into the system, so they probably had to wait and check that it was not already reserved and the system just had not updated yet. Well, I wanted those seats and I better have gotten those seats. Me. Well, due to the small size of our theater, all our seats have just as good of a view. So, even if you did not get those specific seats, they will still be just as good. The box office still is not open, so you can either wait or come back later to check and see. Entitled Mom starts getting pretty heated at this. Well, I can't wait. I need to see it now, because I am going to a restaurant now, and I do not want to lose out on my seats because they did not do their job right. Friend. Well, we could maybe try and find Boss in the back. The box office is still not open, but maybe she can confirm your reservation. Entitled Mom, pleased with this, agrees and waits with me in the lobby. Boss shows up and talks with Entitled Mom and decides to save herself the headache and goes back to grab Entitled Mom's tickets. Entitled Mom leaves and we all laugh at the situation, thinking it was over. We were very wrong. Entitled Mom comes storming in, maybe 15 minutes later, and the box office is still closed. Entitled Mom, an angry, even higher pitched voice than before. These are not the seats I had asked for. Where is boss? I want the tickets I had reserved. Me. I'm sorry. Might have just been a simple mistake. Boss is busy getting the show ready right now. And you can get it fixed when the box office opens. Entitled Mom. Well, I can't wait for it to open. I still need to go to dinner. I wanted to get them early because I knew it would be full. If this continues, I will just come back and buy the tickets with the right seats. Friend. Well, here, let me see your tickets. I used to work house, and I can tell you where these will be. Ah, these seats are really good seats. Almost up front and in the middle. I don't want to be up front. That is not the seats I wanted. This needs to be fixed. Me. Well, box office still is not open, and people are getting everything ready for the performance, so you will just have to wait. Entitled Mom gets even angrier, makes a groaning sound, and stomps her feet like a kid, then storms out. Friend decided to go find Boss again to warn her about what was coming down the line. Boss quickly went into the box office, found out she just accidentally grabbed the name behind hers for tickets, and rushed out the door to see if she could catch the Entitled Mom. Entitled Mom was storming back right at that moment with her husband in tow, probably to try to use him to intimidate us into giving her different seats. Despite the fact that we don't even work there, Boss meets up with them and in her amazingly passive-aggressive, sarcastic voice says, Here is your free tickets. We are so sorry for the inconvenience. It would have been much easier if the box office was actually open. For actors and staff, we get two tickets for free for each show. So this entitled mom was putting up all this fuss over tickets she did not even pay for. Entitled mom is obviously not happy with her tone, but seems a bit put in her place. Boss brings us back into her office, where we all start laughing. She then gives us cake as an apology for having to deal with that when we were just trying to enjoy our visit. She then said that she would personally seat Entitled Mom when she came back for the show. The best part of this whole experience was when we saw Entitled Mom come in and sit down. Her reserved seats were all of four seats to the right of the mixed up ones in the same row. So her whole complaint about not wanting the front row was one incorrect in the first place and two the exact same row she wanted to be in she was also almost late for the show and came in right before they closed the doors next we've got bus boy caught taking people's tips fired that night backstory my wife and i had our favorite restaurant that we frequented a lot at least once a week so we got to know everyone working there pretty well and became close friends with a few of the servers and the manager one of our friends was working that night and approached us to help him out. He said he got complaints from a couple of servers about tips completely missing, like a $0 tip on a $100 bill from regulars that always tip. He was suspecting that it was the busboy doing it, but had no proof. We were sitting across from a table that was just finishing up 
so our friend waited until they were gone and replaced the tip with like 10 to 15 dollars of his own the actual tip was much larger and left the check holder on the table he then asked us to just keep an eye on the table when the bus boy came by and report back to him well as we watched he cleared the table put the check holder in his apron and disappeared around the corner to a hidden section of the restaurant and returned a minute later to replace the holder to the now clean table. Our friend came by, and as suspected, the holder was empty. We then relayed what we saw, busboy taking the holder, disappearing, etc. I remember seeing him slump visibly and walk off like he knew the truth but didn't want it to be so. We talked later with our friend, and he along with the manager confronted the busboy on what happened and gave him the chance to confess and be fired with no further actions taken. He owned up to it and was escorted out. Everyone working there was kind of bummed, even despite getting their tips stolen, because it was a small family-owned type place and the owner had taken a chance on hiring the kid. Everyone really liked him and he had had some troubles earlier on in life and was just trying to turn things around. He was only like 18 or 19 at the time, but couldn't seem to get out of his own way. I had two reactions to this. The first was the complete r slash unethical life pro tips route of why in the world are you taking the whole tip? Skim a few bucks here and there. You may not get caught, at least for a while, but you take the whole dang tip? The second was that the parent in me wanted to pull him aside and just try to get through. They took a chance on hiring you and you pull this crap? This isn't rock bottom, but you are heading there quick if you don't shape up. Next we've got Entitled Family Buys Their First Fish Tank. So I've taken up fish keeping as a hobby and let me just tell you, those little guys are a lot of work. I'm in my local pet shop at least once every other week, to the point that they've gotten to know me pretty well. It's a chain store, but the staff at this place is really excellent and I cannot heap enough praise upon them. They do a really good job of making sure to have at least one decently knowledgeable person there working in every section. Anyway, the other day I popped in to grab some fish food and since I had room, maybe a couple of fish if they had anything interesting. It was semi-busy, and the fish section guy was busy helping a family of two parents and one very rambunctious girl who was running back and forth through the fish aisle. Every once in a while, the girl stopped to stare at one of the tanks and points out a fish she liked. Mommy's cooing, wow, without looking up from the phone. Meanwhile, dad came back over with a 15-gallon tank, which is relatively small for a tank, and basically all of the equipment, decorations, you name it everything you'd need to get started. Okay, sweetie, he said. Ready to pick out some fishies? This stopped the fish guy in his tracks. Uh, are those fish for that tank you're buying? Dad enthusiastically replied. Yep, it's our first fish tank. Okay, so I wouldn't expect this to be universal knowledge, but it is important to know if you plan on getting fish. It's a really bad idea to set up a fish tank and put the fish in on the same day. It's even worse if you put many fish in it simultaneously because you need to give the tank time to settle first. Depending on the source, the water may have to be treated as most species of fish are somewhat particular in the water conditions they can handle and if you were including things like life plans, you need to give them time to make the changes to the water that they inevitably make. Otherwise, the stress and shock from unsuitable conditions or a rapid change in water quality can hurt the fish quite quickly. For a more scientific explanation of all this, look up aquarium cycling. Anyway, the fish guy politely explained this to the family and said that it's typically the store policy to not sell fish and a tank to customers on the same day. The tank should take about a week or two to cycle, and if there are any fish that they really want, they can buy them in advance and the store will hold them in a special tank until they're ready to be picked up. The little girl piped up with, Daddy, when can I get my fishy? And this guy went straight to, I'm sorry, sweetheart. This man is saying you can't have a fishy right now. Immediately, this girl ran about six feet back, slammed her back up against the fish tanks, slid to the door, and started sobbing. Mommy rushed to the girl and immediately started with, Don't worry, Daddy will get your fishy. Fish guy didn't really know how to handle this at this point, but lucky him that the manager was just happening to walk by. Is everything okay here? He asked. Dad replied with, Yeah, this guy won't sell us a fish. The manager then asked, Is it for that tank you're holding, sir? Dad said, Yes. And the manager began to give him the same exact explanation as the fish guy before. Dad cut in with, 
Yeah, I heard that spiel. Don't care. The manager was trying to reiterate why it is such a bad idea to do this, and the dad finally said, Like I said, I don't care. You see that girl right there? I am more than happy to let that go on all day until you sell me some fish. The manager sighed, looked at the fish guy and said, Just give him the dang fish, and walked away for what I can only imagine was the most important cigarette of the day. The dad stood there looking all smug and announced, Okay, sweetie, you can get your fish. And it was like a switch got flicked and the girl stopped immediately, like she had never had a tantrum in her life. As if it were not enough for them to get their way, this family proceeded to pick out a fish from virtually every tank. I wish I were joking. Without thinking twice, these people put together an abomination of a tank. You see, there are many kinds of fish. Some are big, some are small. Some are solitary, and some hang out in groups. Some like to nibble on store-bought flakes, and some delight in tearing the next nearest fish into fresh flakes. These are the things you must consider when stocking a tank with fish. These people did not consider that. Remotely. I'm talking like single specimens of fish that should be in a group. Some larger fish like goldfish, which honestly need like 10 gallons apiece. Some catfish that are almost certainly not going to eat flakes from the surface. Basically, a whole bunch of fish that should not be together and not crammed into 15 gallons of water. But friends, there is at least some assurance that these people will have a learning experience. You see, the very last fish they grabbed was what the father called the biggest goldfish I've ever seen. Fish guy tried to explain, but by that point they had completely tuned him out. Look, his name is Oscar, like Oscar the Grouch. Heh, <laughs> Grouch, that's putting it lightly. Because you see, Oscar was not a goldfish. Oscar was an Oscar, a type of cichlid. They are territorial as heck, and this guy was destined for a 15 gallon tank of many much smaller fish. So they went off to pay. They left a decent number of zebrafish, so I ended up asking for those. I told the guy, and don't worry, my tank cycled and is well established. He just put his head down and said, those idiots. I replied, I feel bad for the fish though. He said that when they inevitably come back for a refund, they'll have a hard time with it when the receipt shows both the tank and the fish. Anyway, if Oscar survived the water conditions, I'm sure they're having a National Geographic moment right now. I'll try to remember to follow up if the same guy is working next time I go in. He's there frequently, so am I. I should probably learn his name. I'm bad with that kind of stuff. Next we've got, none of us work here, lady. So back in 2009, the company I had been working for went out of business, yet another victim of the credit crunch. And after about six months of unemployment, I was starting to get a little depressed. So my mom suggested that I should do some voluntary work just to give me something to do. After checking with the job center that it wouldn't affect my unemployment benefits, I went to the local branch of a national charity to see if they needed anyone. They did, and I soon became part of the small team that ran that particular location. Everyone there was a volunteer, mostly older, retired people. So being in my mid-twenties at the time, I was given most of the physical work, which suited me fine as I'm not too good at paperwork. Now I should explain that the charity rents out equipment for elderly and disabled people, charging just enough to keep us running and providing a little extra for any unexpected costs that might pop up. The only paid employee we had was a manager who worked out of a different branch in another town, maybe an hour away. Our branch was located in a small building adjacent to a pay and display car park in the center of town with about seven dedicated, clearly marked parking bays. Given our location, it wasn't unusual for people to come in asking questions about the car park and we all quickly became used to it. Sometimes we'd get people angry about getting a ticket, but they usually calmed down when we explained that it wasn't anything to do with us. Now that I've set the scene, on to our story. It's been 10 years, so I'm going by memory. Cast. We've got me. We've got team leader. We've got volunteer and entitled lady. It was a pretty normal day. Must have been a Tuesday, given who was on, and I was down one end of the single large room that made up the bulk of the building, doing some housekeeping, when an older woman, I'd say mid to late 60s, walked in. I only looked around to see if I was needed to get anything, but kept out of it. Little did I know that I was about to experience what I now know to be a Karen in the wild. Volunteer. Hello, how can we help you? Entitled lady. Yes, I've parked in one of the disabled bays next to the building here. Volunteer. Oh, and have you used us before? No, 
I'm just taking my husband to the dentist. This was across the road that ran down one side of the car park. Volunteer. Oh, I'm sorry, but those bays are reserved for people using our scheme. Entitled lady cutting her off. My husband has a blue badge. For those who don't know, a blue badge is a government-issued disabled parking permit that's recognized almost everywhere in the UK. Volunteer. I see, but those bays aren't part of the actual car park. Entitled lady. It's a blue badge. We can park anywhere. Note. No, you can't. There are still restrictions on their usage, but not everyone reads the booklet that comes with it. At this point, our team leader stepped out of her office by the door. Team leader. I'm sorry, but those are private bays. We rent them separately from the landowner. But my husband has a blue badge. Yes, but they're private parking bays. You obviously don't understand how these things work. Team leader, leaning forward on the crutches she needed to get around. Really? Now, I'm still friends with team leader, and while she's a friendly, outgoing person, I've seen her when she blows her lid and decided that it would be a good idea if I stepped in at this point. Me. Private parking spaces aren't necessarily covered by the blue badge scheme. Entitled lady simply glares at me as if I was beneath her notice, so I go back to what I'd been doing. I didn't pay much attention to the rest of the conversation, but eventually entitled lady stormed off in a huff and moved her car. Not long after, one of the volunteers, I forget who, was outside and saw her, having parked on the road directly outside the dentist's, talking to a traffic warden. Note, the car park was private property and was overseen by a private company, so a council-employed traffic warden had no say over anything that happened there. No matter how excitedly Entitled Lady gestured towards our office, we assumed that that was the end of it. But would I really be posting this here if that was the case? No, no I wouldn't. Entitled Lady comes back in, demanding to speak to our manager. Team leader is behind the desk at this point and informs her that she is indeed the team leader, even holding up her laminated name badge that clearly stated as much. Entitled lady scoffs at this and repeats that she wants to speak to the manager now. Team leader explains that the manager is based out of main office in the other town, but dutifully produces a letterhead with the phone number and address, even writes on it the manager's full name. Entitled lady grabbing the piece of paper, I'll have you all fired for this. Team leader, volunteer, and me, laughing to various degrees. We're all volunteers here. None of us are actually employed by the charity. Entitled lady gives a <laughs> that would put an enraged elephant to shame, spins on her heels, and storms off again. Well, we laugh about it, but put it out of mind, as we have better things to think about. Then, about two weeks later, one of the trustees for the charity pops in, and we learn what happened next. Entitled Lady called the main office and spent an hour on the phone with the manager, not realizing that Team Leader had already emailed her an account of what had happened. The manager tries to explain to Entitled Lady that, no, we had actually been in the right, and yes, she would have gotten a ticket if she had parked in one of our bays. Entitled Lady was having none of it and informed the manager that she'd be taking it to her superiors. A few days later, a letter had arrived addressed to the managing director of the charity, the name of the return address evidently being the same that Entitled Lady had given. Well, charities don't have managing directors, and as no one in the office felt like getting involved with that particular brand of crazy, the story having gotten around to everyone, the unopened letter was stuck to the notice board with a thumbtack. To the best of my knowledge, it remains there to this day. I have since found the job, but I still pop into the charity with tea, coffee, and biscuits from time to time. But I always look in the window first to check for Karen's. Karen complains about prices and ruins a great deal for herself. This story took place over the course of a few weeks. Bear with me as I recall the details. I work at a thrift shop. Most items are priced based on quality and condition. However, we do have set prices for some items. One such item is Monster High Dolls. We get them pretty often, so the general rule is that each doll goes out for $5. If it's in bad shape or missing bits, it's $4. And if it's clothed with accessories, it's $6. It's always been this way, and this is a standard across all of our locations. I've had customers ask why these dolls are more expensive than our Barbies or other dolls out there, and I usually explain that Monster High dolls offer articulated joints and are popular for customizing and sculpting off of. When we get into a conversation about it, usually the customer will understand why the dolls are on the pricier side. Well, not this lady. This lady brought up about 10 dolls to the register and immediately asked my cashier for a manager, myself. 
She asks why the dolls are expensive. I explain why and assume she'll understand. But no. She instead insists that the other stores sell these dolls for $3 and she even found one in the package with all these extra accessories for only $8. I told her that unfortunately without some proof, I wouldn't be able to honor such a reduced price but did offer her $5 for a couple of her $6 picks due to minor imperfections. That was two or so weeks ago, and I assumed that that was the end of it, but I was wrong. This lady came back about a week ago and told me she was so glad she could catch me again because she has something to show me. I got a little excited because I thought she was going to show me her collection or a doll she had customized. She brought all my expectations down when I saw, she was showing me pictures of Monster High dolls from other locations. Sure enough, priced at $3 across the board. I was so surprised, I just stared. She put on a smug face and told me, See? Your dolls are maybe just a little overpriced. And with how snotty her voice was, it took everything in me to be civil when I told her that I would speak to the store manager to clarify whether our prices were right or the other location's prices. She walked away thinking she had won, and I walked away, kind of defeated. The next day when I saw the store manager was in, I asked him if we had a set price for Monster High dolls. He told me yes, and together we reviewed the pricing standard for dolls. We even went out onto the sales floor to make sure we really were on track with our pricing. Seeing as we have never had to recycle a single Monster High doll for not selling, we decided we did not need to lower the prices. Now, just today, the store manager approached me when I started my shift, grinning ear to ear. He had a story to tell me. Apparently, this lady had gone to the other locations within our city and complained and moaned about our horribly overpriced dolls to the cashier who brought the manager over to share the conversation. She told them they should talk to that other store and see about lowering our prices a notch. And so the manager did what any good manager ought to do. She followed up and reviewed the pricing standard for these toys and dolls. To her horror, she saw that their store was in the wrong. They were practically giving these dolls away, and the pricing standard wasn't even posted at the tables, so the pricers had no idea they were pricing things incorrectly. She emailed our store manager immediately with her findings and asked us for our thoughts. My store manager told her that he and his team had encountered the lady as well and recommended reviewing the standards with her team so that they could price correctly. Then he cc'd the email to the district manager, who later in the night rolled out an email about following pricing standards more thoroughly across all departments to prevent customers like her from trying to undermine us like that again. So basically, this lady completely destroyed a really good deal for herself by raising a stink about the overpriced dolls at the other store. She's gonna be in for a nasty surprise when she next visits and finds all the dolls are appropriately priced. So much for her doll collection. Speaking of collections, do you have anything that you collect? If so, please let me know what it is in the comments. Next we've got update on the entitled family who bought their first fish tank. Well, 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 lucky you and unlucky me. Because I came home from work this afternoon and tested my tank water to find I have a nasty little ammonia spike going on. Probably has to do with the snail food I recently discovered one of my minnows stockpiling inside a barnacle. Nothing but drama, these fish. Anyway, that meant I had to pop off to the shop for some bacterial cultures. These things help in this situation, consult Google for science. And of course, I had my fingers crossed fish guy was working. Well, what do you know? I guess today's not so unlucky after all. Usually in this store, I spend a minute or two milling around and browsing before I actually get to the meat of my shopping, but today, I walked straight up to him. Didn't just launch into it though, I let him know my problem and asked him what he would recommend, kind of already half knowing what I was going to get. Then I just casually slipped in. You know, it's probably karma. I was in here on Sunday judging this family so hard for insisting they fill an uncycled tank with random fish, and now... That's about as far as I got before he started wildly cackling. He composed himself, apologized, and said, Oh, you watched that one go down? I said yes, and that I wondered how it was going for that guy. Fish guy then gave me the skinny on everything, as apparently I missed some stuff. Fish guy is good people. 
So according to Fish Guy, everything with this family started basically normal. Family comes in, girl is getting a fish as a reward for something. Fish Guy couldn't remember, but said it was something stupid. Fish Guy shows them around the fish section, and the whole time the dad keeps saying that he's always been a fish person, and a few times mentions fishing from the boat. The next town over is super affluent, lots of families with a spot at the marina. This is why Fish Guy let them get as far as they did before bringing up cycling. He thought they knew and were taking it into account. The first thing they grabbed was the tank. After that, they start making a beeline for the live fish and Fish Guy says, Hey, wait, you might want a filter, heater, tank cover, etc. Dad says those aren't necessary. This is Fish Guy's first inclination something is off. Fish Guy is trying to stress the importance of having the equipment and Dad is brushing it off like it's just an upsell. We'll clean it ourselves. We keep our house warm, etc. Finally, Fish Guy convinces Dad to, at the very least, get a filter and a net, because I guess by this point he knew. Dad goes off to grab a bunch of plastic plants and gravel, comes back, and everything after that is the scene I witnessed. So, I know what you're all wondering. What the heck happened to Oscar? Well, folks, I've got your answer, and it ain't nice. Disclaimer. The following is a second-hand account of a second-hand account. Fish Guy didn't see this go down, but it was all reiterated to him by the manager, the same one who told Fish Guy to just make the sale. Yesterday, which was Tuesday as of writing this, Dad came back with an empty tank and the filter. He told the associate at the register he wanted to do a return. Associate said okay and asked if the stuff had been used. Dad said no. Associate looked at the stuff and saw that the tank hadn't been cleaned very well and that the filter was badly repackaged. Associate then asked if Dad had a receipt. Dad produced the receipt and said he'd like a refund for the full amount of the receipt. Associate saw that the receipt had live fish on it, in addition to all the other stuff he hadn't brought back, and told him that she couldn't accept the return as the stuff had clearly been used and as per store policy, they cannot accept returns of used goods unless they are defective or recalled or something. So of course, Dad asked for the manager. Now apparently the manager felt really bad after the fact about making the sale. According to Fish Guy, manager lost his mother on Saturday and he had to report to work on Sunday morning. Not his best day. He just wanted to make it stop and apparently afterward was dreading them coming back because he knew they would. Because someone would have to deal with it and it would invariably be worse. Anyway, no sooner did the manager get to the front end when dad starts chewing him out about traumatizing his daughter. That mutant goldfish, you didn't give us enough water. Y'all, these idiots thought the water included in the fish bags was enough to fill their tank. Now, granted, they got a lot of fish from a lot of tanks, so I would imagine after including all the gravel and decorations, maybe they were able to get that tank like one third of the way full. So I guess I could see how a complete idiot could maybe do the mental gymnastics to make that assumption. But still, really? Anyway, from what I'm told, Oscar went in last, and apparently it wasn't like two minutes until the carnage began. I'm told the daughter witnessed it and freaked out. Dad scooped out Oscar and flushed him, alive. So of course now they were left with a mostly not full tank of some living, some dead, and some maimed fish. Dad got the bright idea that it was the pet store's fault the fish got eaten because they didn't give them enough water. What did he do? If you guessed filling the rest of the tank with icy cold tap water, you're a winner. I'm told the defective, as dad put it, fish started going belly up with a quickness, and so dad got fed up and dumped the lot of them. Told his daughter they would try a different pet. Anyway, dad finished ranting all of this at manager like it was going to win him points, and manager basically told him, Well, we warned you, we will not refund you, and we suggest you take your business elsewhere. Dad threatened to get in touch with corporate and manager's response was along the lines of, if anything, they'll be mad I sold you the fish in the first place. Dad stormed out and left the stuff. So yeah, there's the scoop. Wanted to get that up while the details were still fresh in my memory. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got something like 20 gallons of water to swap around. Next we've got, stop lying, I want her fired. A little background. I work in a retail store inside a shopping mall and we are required to wear all black. 
Our store doesn't have a washroom, but a larger store down the hall does have a public washroom, which is closer to me than any others. So I usually just head down there when I gotta go. Now, the employees at this store also wear all black, but they have name tags with the company logo that they all wear on their shirt. I'm usually wearing a lanyard with my company name on it that I take off when leaving the store. On this particular day though, I left it on. It isn't uncommon for myself and my coworkers to be mistaken for employees at this store, and we have customers ask us if we are working or if we could help them with something. But once we say that we actually don't work there, everyone has an awkward chuckle and moves on with their day. That is not what happened with this entitled Karen. So anyways, I'm walking through the store towards the washroom when entitled Karen huffs and pulls herself off the mattress she was testing. She looked around with her arms crossed and you could see her eyes narrow as she saw me walking towards her direction. Excuse me? I knew she was wanting a question answered, so I just put my hands up and said, I'm sorry, I don't work here. She looked me up and down. You obviously do. Look, I was just wondering. No, ma'am. I'm sorry, but I don't work here. I showed her my company's logo and told her where I worked, down at another store. Okay, well, you work at the mall, so you can still help me. I need this, but wanted to talk about financing. I'm in a hurry and just want to get this done. Me, I really can't help you with that. I'm just trying to use the washroom and get back to my work. Don't you dare lie to me. I told you I'm in a hurry. And I told you I don't work here. There's a service desk down that way you can try. She was fuming and her face was going red. A few people had walked by, but no employees. So I tried to just walk away, but she stepped out in front of me. You are going to help me with this and then you can go do whatever you want, okay? Me, no, I'm sorry, but I have to go. I turned around to head back to my store and shake off this crazy lady when an actual store employee headed over. Ugh. Maybe you can help me. I want her fired. Employee. Uh, she doesn't work for us. Stop lying. I want the manager. Employee. Okay, if you'll just follow me. And she is coming too. Points to me. Me. No, I'm just going to the washroom and heading back to work. No, you are coming to speak to the manager about how to better serve your customers. I just shook my head and walked off which sent her into a screaming fit. She was yelling at the employee and any customers who walked by, then eventually stormed off in another direction. Nothing ever came of this. I still laugh with my coworkers about this whenever we almost forget to leave our lanyards. Next we've got, he was a public health risk, so I got him promoted to customer. Years back, I worked in the back of house for a chain of fast casual restaurants. Let's call it Emerald Wednesday. I had been there for quite some time and had seen many managers, both good and bad, come and go. They typically lasted just a couple of years. We had been gifted a general manager who was sent to our store as his last chance to salvage his career and when he failed, we were without a general manager for a couple of months. The assistant managers ran the restaurant and things were okay, but no one was getting promoted within the company. Then the district manager went with an outside hire that was coming in from the other side of the country. This guy was a complete idiot. We'll call him Johnny. He had zero experience as a general manager and wasn't even applying for the position, but the district manager talked him into taking the job. Big mistake. Under Johnny's tutelage, our Emerald Wednesday started to slowly fail, mostly due to his mismanagement. He was belligerent to the staff making a couple of the girls cry by belittling them in front of everyone else. He was so lazy, he'd hide in the office on busy weekends while we struggled without a manager. He refused to do even the basics of his job, like the nightly pole thaw. For those who don't know, many things are kept frozen in the walk-in freezer and are pulled forward to the cooler at night so that they thaw before morning. This was rarely done on Johnny's evening shifts. We would routinely have to force thaw steaks, shrimp, and chicken under running cold water, which is not something that we're supposed to even do. I saw on a few occasions that Johnny was cross-contaminating foods under the running water, a pan of frozen shrimp sitting on top of or even in a pair of frozen steaks. At one point, I didn't see this one, Johnny ran some frozen steaks under hot water to thaw them quickly 
because they needed to be cooked right then. This was a huge problem, and had I seen it, I'd have wanted to punch the fool in his face. We sometimes ran checks of multiple hours and had frequent guest complaints. One guest even threw his silverware at the host. Johnny was called up front and actually took the guest's side, leaving the host in tears. I believe he even comped the guy's meal. Johnny was a real class act. I made it my mission to do something about him. At the very least, he was going to get someone very ill from his shenanigans. So I sat down with a district manager who had brought Johnny in and spoke with him at length and great detail about how bad Johnny was, how terrible the morale was, and how he could get people ill, all of it. He asked me point blank what I thought of Johnny, and I told him, Johnny is an idiot. Nothing came of it. Christmas was coming, and I knew I was quitting in a couple of months. Johnny insisted on having a Christmas party at a bar a town away, but fraternizing between management and hourly employees was against company policy, so I didn't go. Johnny got quite drunk and drove himself home. I heard from coworkers that Johnny had been pulled over. Oops. A week or so later, I wrote a lengthy email detailing everything Johnny had messed up on, wrote about the Christmas party, and included screenshots of court records I was able to look up on the town's website. I set up a burner email account and messaged everyone I could find in the Emerald Wednesday hierarchy. When I went back to work a couple of days later, we had a shiny new general manager and no one knew what I had done. I am not proud of this, but he was making lives miserable. The restaurant was failing, and I was certain he was a public health risk. How do you thaw out frozen meat? Do you let it sit, or do you run it under cold water? Let me know in the comments. Next we've got, don't mess with a Navy vet. So, just a note, this isn't my story, it's my grandfather's. Some backstory, he's 79 and kicking, but isn't in the best shape anymore. He was drafted into the army while in high school and then enlisted in the navy afterwards. Before I was born, he was honorably discharged and until I was about two, he was getting a criminal justice degree and then went on to be the sheriff of the county he lives in. He retired probably four to six years ago. My grandma also worked in the army. She had a desk job, I don't know the specifics, and retired three years before my grandpa did. So they make a decent amount in pensions. Not a lot, but enough to pay taxes on the house that's been in my grandma's family for a few generations and enough to spoil us grandkids when we come visit, as grandparents do. It will be important to note, later in the story, that I have an uncle who lives in the same town as my grandpa and is currently a deputy for the police department. Anyways, on to the story. So maybe four years ago, I was just 14, my grandpa decided he wanted a shed. He's a big woodworking guy and makes benches and bookshelves and nightstands etc etc in his free time. But he isn't in shape to build a structure even with the help of my cousins. So he decided to hire this guy who we'll call John. He liked hiring local and this guy was from the small town my grandpa was from and still lives in. When my grandpa hires John in the winter, he says he'll start construction at the beginning of spring. Where we live, this is usually when the weather allows as it snows well into spring for some years, and he'll have the construction done by the end of fall. He gives my grandpa a quote. I don't know the amount exactly. My grandpa is excited to have a little workshop of his own, and so is my grandma, because she doesn't like all the noise the saws and drills make when he works in the basement. Spring rolls around, and John doesn't show. My grandpa already had to pay a small portion up front, so he's a little upset, and calls John to ask where he is. John says he got another contracting project out of town and it will be a bit before he can get back to my grandfather's shed. He didn't come until October. Due to the weather in the state I live in, that meant construction really couldn't start. He got the foundation down and that was it. My grandpa is a little upset but understands. Hey, this local guy got a big gig, not a big deal. It takes this guy three years to finish the shed, so my grandpa is angry, understandably but doesn't say anything to him. He pays John what John quoted him, plus additional costs because of the time it took, but he calls the company that gave John a contracting permit to file an official report against him. I don't know how this works, and I might be getting this part wrong. It goes without a hitch. He thinks it's over, right? Wrong. On my cousin's graduation that year, John, uninvited, shows up and tells my grandpa he still owes $6,000. My grandpa basically told him to come back on a different day because my cousin is more important. That night, he got an email from John's lawyer. It was something along the lines of, 
You still owe John and John's wife, let's call her Jill, $6,000 that hasn't been paid. My grandpa responds with, send me an invoice. He instantly got in touch with his lawyer. He doesn't get an electronic invoice, but two days later gets a letter on his doorstep with a note inside signed by Jill saying, you still owe $6,000 with the original quote attached, but the cost whited out. So there was an additional nearly $10,000 added. So he sends the original copy of the quote, along with a letter from Jill, as well as a printed copy of the email from John and Jill's lawyer to his lawyer and talks to my uncle, who we'll call Dave. So Dave starts asking people offhand about John and starts bringing John up to his work friends before finding out that a few years prior, John had been reported for theft, but the case hadn't went anywhere. Dave digs a little and finds more and more police reports saying that John has repeatedly stolen from people around the town as well as failed to pay the people that he hires over the summer. The police department couldn't deal with this, so that's why no arrests had been made as they're all matters that needed to be settled in court. Dave starts making a small file full of copies of the reports. Meanwhile, my grandpa's lawyer is trying to sort out the issue without my grandpa needing to go to court. My grandpa gets a discount that lowers the 6,000 still owed to about 4.5,000, but my grandpa is still livid. And after talking to Dave, he decides he's going to take it to court. My grandpa goes to court with his lawyer and has both the small packet from Dave as well as his own records. I wasn't there for the trial, so I can't say exactly what happened, but John had to pay out $10,000 plus some to my grandpa, as well as numerous other fees to various other clients and employees, had to do community service work, I don't remember how much, and got his contracting license permanently revoked. Last I heard, John and Jill had moved out of the country and John was working as a cashier somewhere due to the fact that he couldn't become a contractor and hadn't gone to school for anything else. Since then, he's found some sketchy spots in the structure, but nothing major. So with the help of my oldest cousin, 19, they can actually fix the problems before they get bad. My grandpa loves his shed, by the way, and built me a bookshelf for my 17th birthday. Karen thinks her son deserves honors placement regardless of his grades. I worked in a pretty affluent school district for 14 years and met a lot of entitled parents. These two from my first year of teaching never left my mind though. Obviously, dialogue is not really accurate. As an 8th grade English teacher, it was my job to recommend either Honors English, Level 1 English, or Level 2 English for my students' 9th grade year. Personally, I hated this. I want kids to work to the best of their abilities and not make them feel inferior when they just might not be mentally mature enough for a higher placement yet. Math and Science also had to make similar recommendations. To clarify, Level 1 was a normal, rigorous class probably comparable to the class I was currently teaching. Level 2 was for kids who really struggled with reading and writing. Honors was very intense. Students would write numerous papers that might not even get graded. They would have multiple chapters to read independently each night, frequent tests and quizzes, and no grammar instruction because they should already have mastered it at this point. It was probably appropriate for maybe 20% of my students at most. Math and science were tracked in the same way. Parents never liked this either. Multiple complaints every year, but parents could choose to wave their kids into whichever level they decided. Pretty much never went well. So many kids who would wave into honors would fail quarter one and need to drop a level before the end of the semester. On the other hand, if they dominated in level one, their current teacher could suggest moving them up. These two entitled parents asked for a meeting with me the math teacher and science teacher. When they joined us in the room we were meeting in, they were absolutely simmering with rage. Their son had not been recommended for any honors classes and that was not okay. Basically, we explained, kiddo did a good job, did his homework, got solid B's and some A's, did what he was asked, no more, no less. He fit the description of a level one. Entitled dad, either you are all wrong or this school has failed our son. He came in with straight A's in elementary school. You obviously didn't teach him well enough, or you placed him incorrectly. Entitled Mom. My husband and I graduated from Ivy League schools. Our other two kids are in Ivy League schools. Us. Okay, <laughs> but we aren't placing them or you. We're placing this kiddo. And pretty much, if you do your work in our elementary schools, you get an A. Entitled Dad. 
Well then, you need to give him more time to do better. He obviously wasn't trying. Us. Honor's kids don't need to be warned to try. They just try and succeed because they are really advanced in these areas. How will he get into a good college if he is at level one? Every year, almost all of the senior class goes on to college. Some fantastic colleges too. Plus, if he does well, he can go up a level. Then put him in honors. And if he does badly, he can move down. Us. That can be really tough on a kid. To be in a class with others and then have to leave because you can't achieve what they can? Also, the class has to slow down to try to help any kid who isn't grasping the material, and now the whole class is behind. It's much better for a kid's self-esteem to do so well they move up. Also, remember, you can wave him in. Entitled Mom We don't want to wave him in. We want you to recommend him. Entitled Dad All of our friends' kids are in honors. How would it look if we had to wave ours in? Ding, 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 there it is. They can't hold their heads high in the country club if their son is just normal. We ended up saying if he made a drastic improvement by the end of the year, we would reconsider. By the way, he didn't. Even with some incredible papers written at home for my class, weird how he couldn't write as well in class. Parents waved him in. He did horrible in all three and ended up back in level one for all except science. Ended up passing science by the skin of his teeth. Honestly, my heart goes out to him. That's really difficult, especially if your parents are comparing your success to theirs, your siblings, and your neighbors. Speaking of classes, what was your favorite class in school? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got, Delivery Driver Gets His Karma Twice. I was driving down a small country road with a 45 mile per hour speed limit that some choose to ignore. And coming up behind me was a standard work truck. I won't name names, but it was a popular automotive parts store delivery truck and got right on my bumper. I'm not in a tiny car, but it's a sedan and he was so close that all I saw was grill and hood in my mirrors. While I stayed doing the speed limit, after about three minutes, he decided that a sharp curve was the perfect time to pass me and surprise, surprise, there was a car coming after the curve. He swerved at me and I slammed the brakes, nearly missing his bumper. Thankfully, I had this all on dash cam, front and back. I got home and got the footage on my laptop and called their 1-800 number with his plate number and his truck number. The woman I spoke to was super apologetic and she asked me to send her the video. She watched it while on the line with me and immediately asked if she could put me on hold. I said yes and a few minutes go by and she comes back and brings me someone else on the line, the local store manager of that driver. She had sent him the video and the manager apologized a ton and promised me right then and there that that employee was terminated for their behavior. A few weeks go by and I don't hear anything till a friend of mine on Facebook sends me a link. The driver that was fired managed to get my name from his HR or manager or something and was trying to find me in real life because he lost his job and made a video wearing his work uniform threatening me because of everything. I went to my local police station about it and showed them the video and explained everything and was told I needed to speak to that company again because they let my name get out. I called them and told them everything going on and I was told I'd get a call from their HR department within two to three business days. Literally six hours later, I received a call from some higher up HR person with one of their legal team on the phone. They wanted me to sign a document stating I won't publicly go after them or give negative PR if they sue him for me and get a restraining order and everything on this guy for what he threatened. They even offered to have a lawyer of my choosing go over it with me at no cost to me and sign it and have them handle it. Another few more weeks go by and that friend on Facebook, he knows that guy's family or something, said that the dude's mom posted some sob story that her son is going through some expensive court case that he likely won't win because the other team is over 10 lawyers. So not only lost his job, but then tried to find me only to have his ex-employer sue him. Next we've got, Entitled Parent Calls My Dad A Liar Because He Doesn't Look Disabled. For some reason, it's almost like my dad and I are entitled parent magnets. When we're together, we usually have some sort of encounter. They're pretty minor most of the time, but occasionally they are absolute horror shows. 
This is one of those times. Cast. We've got Bug. That's me, your idiotic narrator. We've got Dad, the big guy I happen to share genes with. We've got Entitled Dad, very angry and very overweight man in a minivan. We've got Entitled Mom, the minivan man's wife. She was kind of okay. We've got Kids 1 and 2, two very annoying kids, probably about 2 to 3 years younger than me. My dad and I haven't always gotten along, so while I was on leave, we tried to hang out as much as possible. So mostly, that was us running to the store for groceries and other little things. This encounter happened in a Walmart parking lot, so I am not surprised by the lack of brain cells from the entire entitled family we met. A little backstory might help, so here it is. My dad is a veteran, 100% disabled due to his time overseas and as a paratrooper when he was younger. This means he is able to park in handicapped spots. He does this occasionally when his knees are giving him more issues than their normal pain. Today is one such day. Now a little more about my dad. Dude does not look like he is any sort of disabled. Even though he's pushing 50, he still works out as much as his body will allow him to. Man is still built like a gorilla and looks like he's still an infantryman. But anyway, on to the story. My mom asked my dad and I to head over to the store to pick up some food for dinner. Honestly, we ended up grabbing more snacks than anything, but we got what mom had asked for. As we were checking out, we heard the voice of God. Not really. It was the intercom asking for the owner of the gray Ford F-150 parked in the handicapped spot to please come to customer service. Dad. Oh man, if someone stole my truck, I'm gonna cry. Me. Someone probably just doesn't realize that having DV on your license plate means you are a disabled vet. Bet you 20 that's what it is. Him and I finished checking out and headed over to where we were summoned and looked for whoever called for us. The first thing we noticed was the absolute whale of a man, his two kids and his wife standing there. I kid you not, the man's face was beet red and you probably could have fried an egg on it. Also to be fair, calling the guy a whale is an overstatement. He probably was only 250 or 275, but that's still fairly heavy. But this is coming from a 150 pound stick bug so what do I know? Entitled Dad. Is that your truck? Why the heck did you take up a handicapped spot if you're obviously not? Entitled Mom. Her voice actually would have been pleasant if she wasn't so angry. My husband has very serious hip issues and he had to walk from the back of the parking lot to the front of the store because of your rudeness. Dad. Sir, ma'am, I can park there. I am a disabled vet. Entitled Dad. B.S. If you're so disabled, you shouldn't be able to maintain your body like that. Me. Sir, he was injured overseas. Some days it's worse than others, and today his knees keep locking up. My dad then lifted his pants leg to show them his knee braces, which honestly looks like some futuristic exoskeleton make you run fast and jump far kind of thing. The woman immediately looked embarrassed and apologized, something I wish her husband had done. Entitled Dad. I don't give a crap. I had to risk messing up my hip even more because your sensitive little dad's knees hurt, kid. I have actual pain. Entitled Mom. Sir, please forgive my husband. He's just angry right now. Entitled Dad. Shut up, Entitled Mom. Let me handle it. Dang it. My dad and I honestly just wanted to buzz off at that point, so we turned around to walk away when I felt a hand on my shoulder. Kid 1. Hey, kid. Apologize to my dad before you leave, jerk. Now most stories would be like, this kid didn't realize I was a black belt in every form of hand-to-hand -hand combat, but I'm a realist and don't enjoy fighting very much. Me. Bro, I don't have to apologize for crap, so let me go. Kid 1. No, jerk. My dad could have hurt his hip from walking because of you two. Apologize. Me. I don't think I want to. At that point, I was mad from this kid having his grimy high school hand on my shoulder, so I yanked his hand off of me and started to walk away. Hey, forget you, kid. My dad and I just walked away and got into the truck. When we shut our doors, we both burst out laughing because of the entitled dad's idiocy and his kid's rudeness. Dad, hey man, I'm proud of you for not starting a fight or anything. Thanks for standing up for me too, but I had it. Me, I was standing up for you? Nah, man. I was just making sure he didn't realize you were disabled, so I won the bet. Dad. Never mind. You're a jerk. Me. Yeah, I get it from my dad. 
And that's it. No big scene or climax or anything. Nobody got arrested. We just went home and made some enchiladas and had a few bowls of ice cream afterwards. Speaking of ice cream, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Please pause this right now and leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got, Entitled customer tries to return something we don't even sell. So I spent about a year working in a shop that sold equipment and supplies for disabled or elderly people. Walking sticks, wheelchairs, electric scooters, and other, more personal sundries. I actually liked the job, and all things being equal, I'd still be working there today, but that's a story for another day. Anyways, this incident happened on a Saturday, so I was alone in the shop. An older gentleman, I'd say mid to late 60s, came in carrying a plastic bag. He walks up to the counter where I'd been refilling the boxes of those rubber ends for walking sticks and crutches, and I said hello and asked how I could help him. I bought this the other day, but it's no good. He placed the bag down on the counter. I'd like to return it. I didn't recognize him, but figured that the manager must have served him, so I automatically asked if he has the receipt. He produced a sheet of paper. A4 paper, which seemed a little odd. Most items we sold came with just a regular till receipt, while larger items had a three-layer white-yellow-pink form. White copy went with the customer, yellow in our records, and pink to the tax man. Most of what we sold was VAT-free, so we needed to keep records of what we sold and to who. However, what he offered me wasn't the flimsy receipt I was expecting, but just a regular sheet of printer paper. I looked at it and saw that it was from another shop maybe a mile away across the other side of the town center. Oh, you bought this from the other shop? Yes, he nods. Your other shop? The one on this road? <laughs> no, we're a different company. I point to my name badge, which clearly states who I work for. They're the other company. Yes, but you're the same, he insists. We sell similar products, but we're a completely different company. I open the bag to see what was inside. I honestly can't remember exactly what it was, but while we sold similar items that did the same job, we had never sold that particular item. It even had the price label on it, which clearly stated that it was, indeed, from the other shop. We don't even sell this. You'll have to take it back to the other shop. I don't want to walk all the way down there, he exclaimed, and that much I could get behind, given it was raining pretty heavily that day. I want you to refund it now. I'm sorry, sir. But I can't give you a refund for something that you didn't buy from us, and we don't even sell. But you're the same, he repeated, more insistently this time. No, we sell similar products, but they're a completely different company. I so wanted to pinch the bridge of my nose while I struggled to come up with a comparison he might understand. It would be like buying something from Supermarket A, then wanting to return it to Supermarket B. They're both supermarkets, but they're not the same company. But you're the same. He repeated yet again. At this point, I'm starting to wonder if he had some sort of dementia. But aside from his inability to grasp the concept that two shops could sell similar items and yet not be the same company, he seemed fine. No sir, we are not. I do my level best not to sound condescending. We are this shop. They are the other shop. We have no connection with them besides selling similar items. If you want to return this, you will have to go to the other shop. Are you going to give me my refund or not? He asks, clearly convinced that I'm trying to get out of refunding him his money. No, sir. I remain calm. I cannot refund you for something that you did not buy from us. He muttered something about trading standards and the police, then stormed off out of the shop, leaving his item and receipt behind. I put them back in the bag and put the bag under the counter and called the owner. I explained what happened, which quickly had him laughing and he told me to just leave it under the counter in case the man came back, and if he did, give him the number for the main office. The shop I worked at was one of four the company operated. The man never came back, and we never got contacted by trading standards or the police. As far as I know, the bag, the item, and the receipt are still in the stock room to this day. As an aside, the other shop closed suddenly, as in the owner left in the middle of the night, not even telling the staff, after they were caught by trading standards, selling a secret shopper something completely unsuitable for their stated needs, but cost twice as much as what they actually needed was. I, on the other hand, always made sure I sold someone the best fit for their needs, even going so far as to refuse a sale once. But again, a story for another day. Next we've got, 
Nice try, Karen, but you're not my mother. Where this story takes place is actually the only motel my parents have managed thus far. It's pretty old and a lot of things have to be manually done or switched on or off. So it was a Friday and early evening. I was heading down to the opposite side of the hotel to turn on the exterior lights, the electronic sign, parking lot lights, etc. This motel didn't have all doors with electronic locks, so the door I had to get through was actual lock and key. So I'm walking down past all the rooms when a door behind me opens. I keep walking, barely throwing a glance over my shoulder. I eventually make it towards the end and am just about to pull out the key when I hear rapid footsteps. I turn around, stopping another wild Karen in her tracks. Alright, she didn't really look like a Karen, but I had been in the lobby when she checked in and, yeah, no doubt about it. For a second, she actually hesitates to talk, almost fooling me into thinking, oh, great spaghetti monster, was I wrong about her? Ha, <laughs> nope. Karen begins to berate me for not being behind the desk and getting her food. What the heck? It's a motel. Where does she think she is? Like expensive hotel? I tell her in a mocking way, since I honestly gave zero hoots about what she said. Oh, sure. Let me just snap my fingers and conjure food from the non-existent kitchen, your highness. She did not like that. I was sure she would start yelling at me for mocking her, but nope. You're a witch? Once more, I ask. What the heck? This just took a turn that made me long for a big stick to smack her upside the head with because something was obviously just rolling around up there. Maybe if I did it hard enough, I could make her qualified to be shipped up to the loony bin or the funny farm. I start laughing in her face, mostly from my own thoughts. Her face starts to turn this shade of red that makes me laugh even harder because it makes her look like the tomato from Veggie Tales in a blonde wig. Why are you laughing? I'm the manager's wife and I can fire you. Still laughing, I'm bent over trying to breathe properly with tears streaming down my face from laughing so hard. That makes me start snorting from breathing in and out at the same time. I know that's total BS. I wrote in my first post about my parents, right? My parents are the collective manager here. She has no idea. I eventually take a deep breath, clench my nails into my palms, and look this Karen straight in the eyes. You'd fire your own daughter, ma'am? I later told my mother about this and she kind of found it insulting I'd say that. My mom is so much better looking according to my father. Karen looks so dumbfounded by what I'd said that I have to actually turn my head towards the side completely so she's out of my line of vision so I don't start my laughing fit again. She huffs angrily and walks away. I turn on the lights and think that's the end of it. Nope. The morning shift typically has to clean up breakfast. And since I was helping my dad, who at the time was suffering from something unknown in his legs that made it painful to walk, I was the one that was cleaning up breakfast. It's from 6 to 9 and it was about 15 minutes from 10. I was just wiping down the counter now. Nothing was left from breakfast on the counter except for coffee for guests. I go into the back office and started washing dishes, which means that my dad has to keep his ear out for the door chime to go off, signaling that someone has come in. I am in the middle of washing dishes when I hear yelling coming from the front. I'm greatly concerned for my dad and rush towards the office, grabbing my phone from the desk in case I had to call 911. I didn't. Lo and behold, Karen had arrived. She was yelling at my dad about how there was no breakfast set out, how he was a jerk employee and she knew the manager. Yeah, well, she did. She was talking to him after all. My dad kept trying to explain breakfast hours were over and they were under no obligation to keep it open for her, even pointing to the sign right behind his head that stated the hours too. Karen was not having it. She saw me as soon as I walked in. And your employee cursed me last night when I was simply asking for directions. No, she didn't say cursed at me. I have to do the whole nails in palm trick to not start laughing at the memory because I would no doubt get in trouble for that. My dad turns to me and gives me this questioning look. I shake my head and shrug. Ma'am, she's not a- I want her fired right now! Well, as we say in the industry, the customer is unfortunately always right. My dad turns to me, his face away from Karen, and gives me a grin before saying, You heard the lady. You're fired. I give him a returning grin. Okay, dad. I'll go finish the dishes. Karen starts sputtering nonsense, but my dad turns to her and says, Is there anything else I can help you with? Karen demands to see the manager. Now in the back office, a few steps away from the open door that separates the office from front desk, 
I watched my dad stroll into the office in quite a bit of pain, which made me mad. Close the door, wait a minute, before he walks back out and says, I'm the manager here, and I'm asking you to leave the property. Karen screams, Well then, I'm not paying. Okay, guess what? You already paid at check-in, with cash that requires a $50 deposit, so therefore, you're not getting it back. My dad shrugs, and I walk out from behind the desk a moment later to refill the coffee pot where Karen has moved to get some. That's right, she didn't leave. Karen starts yelling at me now. It's endless screaming and yelling. What the heck are you doing? You're fired! I smirk and tell her two things. One, I'm the manager's daughter and not actually an employee. Two, the coffee here is for paying guests, and since you clearly stated you're not paying, you can't have any. The coffee was out anyways, so she couldn't get any even if she tried. Karen, now understanding why I had called her mom the previous night, storms off. I don't see her again for the rest of the weekend. Which, too, wild Karen zero. I had an office food thief, so I bought a hidden camera. A few things about me that made it really lame to have a food thief. I have a lot of food allergies, so I can't just get lunch at the cafeteria or at a nearby restaurant. Because I have a new baby, half the time I don't manage to show up at work with a lunch. I either run out of time to pack one, or if I did remember, I leave it on the counter. My solution to all of this was to leave lots of non-perishable snacks in my office, and also a lot of candy, because I also have a three-year-old, and therefore work is the only place I can shovel Skittles into my mouth without a little hand extending into the field of vision and a little voice saying, please. Snacks that were specifically free of my allergens, some of which were specialty foods because of this. The type of specialty food that just doesn't taste as good as food that contains the allergen and also costs twice as much. Because I'm not getting a lot of sleep right now, I deserve nice things. So, because I'm not getting a lot of sleep right now, when I first came back from maternity leave, assembled my snack hoard and started having things go missing. I genuinely thought I was just losing my mind. Boxes of candy were running out faster than I thought I was eating them. I'd come in in the morning and things wouldn't be where I left them. At one point, I brought a bag of chips to work, folded the rim of the bag down so I wasn't plunging my arm elbow deep into the grease pit and then put a bag clip on it when I went home. And when I came in the next morning, the bag was unrolled and reclipped. I went, wow, I must be more tired than I thought. Rolled the bag back down and the next morning it was unrolled again. Just little things like that, almost every day, that made me go, wow, the post-baby brain is worse than I thought. And then, and then, then I got the flu. I got the flu and I was out for a whole week. Left behind at the office was an almost full box of Enjoy Life cookies, which are not enjoyable, but are free of all major allergens and are also $5 a box for like, 12 sad little sand pies with some cinnamon on top. I ate one row of these cookies and then I was out of the office for a week. For one week, I was not eating any of my snack hoard. But someone else was. Because I came back to work, opened my box of cookies, and found one. There was one single solitary cookie left. And on further examination, the one box of candy that had been opened was nowhere near to be found. And on top of that, the thief had done me the courtesy of opening a new box for me. Except that they actually followed the push here to open instructions instead of just ripping one end of the box like I do. Which they should darn well know at this point. Because by this time, they had been stealing from me for two whole months. The combination of these two things, the sheer audacity it takes to open a new box so you can continue stealing from someone, on top of the consumption of almost a whole box of specialty cookies that aren't even good, enraged me enough that, after going to my boss and getting some vague promises about checking if the security cameras in my wing of the building are functional or not, what? I went straight to Amazon and ordered myself a nanny cam. Not for my baby, for my snack hoard. Conveniently, it arrived the day before Valentine's Day. I set it up on top of a file cabinet looking down at my desk. On the desk, I laid out a fantastic spread of bait snacks. I got all my thief's favorites, and then I took it one step further. I bought myself a valentine heart, broke the seal to make it more inviting, 
and left it out on my desk. The next morning, I came in to see some very obvious snack carnage. My thief had slowly been getting more brazen. Again, who opens a new box of something and opens it differently than the person they are stealing from? But this was just on another level. Individually wrapped things had been dumped out of their boxes. Bits of packaging had been thrown away. And yup, they had eaten some of the valentine candy. For shame, office thief. Don't you know that's from someone who loves me? I played back the video. All was quiet throughout most of the evening, and I was just watching the shadows lengthen as the sun slowly set through the hallway window. And then, shortly before midnight, the night janitor arrived and went right ahead and took a 12 minute break in my office, sitting in my chair, eating my food. I started taking screenshots. I got him shoveling candy into his mouth with full palm to lips intensity, pouring things out onto the desk to pick his favorite flavors, not even bothering to put them back where he found them. And yes, eating my Valentine's candy. Screenshots went directly to my boss in an email. I went directly to my boss's door to hover and grin and ask if he had read my email. And I got assurance of a strongly worded email to the cleaning company and the barring of this particular employee from our place of business. I was also tactfully asked to please take my unauthorized spy camera home, which I did. I thought this was over until the girl who works the concession stand dropped by to thank me. Apparently, the food thief would start his shift just as she was closing down for the night and would try to get free coffee in that creepy guy way. One of the reception staff came by with the same sentiments. I'd never met the guy face to face, but apparently, as a woman, it was not a fun experience to have. I'd shown my screenshots to a few coworkers. Who's eating five rabbits in a long coat's food had become office gossip by this point, and word had spread fast. I worked an earlier shift, so I didn't recognize him, but people whose shifts overlapped with his did. I hadn't told my husband about what I'd done because, when I came home raging about the blatant theft that had gone on while I'd had the flu, his only response had been, you really shouldn't be leaving food at work then. But when I came home with the nanny cam and explained where and why I'd gotten it, his reaction surprised me. You know, I think this is the first time I've seen you stand up for yourself. I'm proud of you. You know what, Reddit? I'm proud of me too. Speaking of snacks, what are your favorites? Please pause the video and leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got, Entitled Customer Loses It Because We Gave Him The Soda He Ordered. For context, both my parents were born and raised in Iowa, but my siblings and I have spent most of our childhoods in varying states of the US because my dad was in the army. We moved to Georgia after his retirement from the military, and while I personally have moved back to Iowa for culinary school, my mom and all of my siblings still live in Georgia. After I graduated from high school, I started working at a popular chicken restaurant in the south that is unfortunately not available up north. One of the biggest reasons I'm looking forward to visiting my family this summer, to be perfectly honest. My older sister, sister too from my previous post, who also worked at the same location and helped me get the job because it was my first job ever and I was inexperienced. I learned quickly enough and it's still one of my favorite jobs to date. Sister 2 was one of the best workers at the store, as well as the favorite of several of the managers. Even though not a single family member of ours lives in the town where that particular store is, she still goes there occasionally to visit her old co-workers. On to the story. Sister 2 and I were both working the drive through that day along with another employee, who we'll call co-worker. It was a busy time in the store, so Jordan was going back and forth between the drive through and the front registers. My sister and I were just fine on our own though, so we didn't mind that he was flip-flopping. So this guy, the entitled dad, comes through the drive through with several kids screaming in the back seat. He orders an entree for himself, and since it was Wednesday, he was able to get two free kids meals with that. Since he was the only adult in the car, he had to pay full price for the other two kids meals. While working out his order, he and my sister have a conversation that goes something like this. Entitled Dad can I get a Coke with my meal? Sister 2. Of course, what kind? Keep in mind, this is the South. And while us Northerners say Coke and mean Coca-Cola, many Southerners use the word Coke to describe any Coke product. 
And given that the soda machine this restaurant had was one of those Coke freestyle ones where you can get any Coke product ever, this was a necessary clarification. Entitled Dad. What? Are you an idiot? A Coke? Me. Sister too, he doesn't have an accent. He probably means Coca-Cola. The four oldest of us were mostly raised among people with Midwestern accents, so most Southerners have an accent to us. Sister too. You're right, you're right. She tells Entitled Dad his total, and he goes up to the window. Evidently, Sister 2's clarification put him in a foul mood, and instead of acting like a civilized human being, he throws his credit card at Sister 2 from his car window for her to process the transaction. Sister 2 has her silent rage face on, but she's been working food service even longer than I have, and she has therefore seen worse, so she says nothing. I wrote down his license plates, then check on Entitled Dad's order and give it to him. Entitled Dad. Can you believe your stupid coworker? What kind of coke? Honestly. Me. Sir, that stupid coworker is my sister, so I would advise you to stand down. I'm the only one allowed to call her stupid. Sister 2 laughs at this because I have never called her stupid in our lives. She's much smarter than me and we both know it. Entitled Dad. Well, maybe you should call her stupid for asking what kind of coke? Me. In case you haven't noticed, many Southerners call soda of any kind Coke, so of course she had to clarify. Sister 2 gives Entitled Dad his Coke, which he takes a sip of and promptly spits out. I wanted Diet Coke! Sister, you asked for Coke. That is Coke. You should have clarified Diet Coke when I asked. Entitled Dad. Shut up! And he throws the Coke at her, soaking her uniform. I was seriously ready to throw hands because that's my sister and he just threw a soda at her. I give him back his card and tell him to kindly buzz off with my customer service smile while coworker goes to grab a manager. Entitled Dad. Give me my Diet Coke and cop my kids meals for your stupid mistake. I simply shut the window and wait for awesome manager. Awesome manager. What happened here? Sister. He threw the drink he ordered at me because he failed to mention he wanted diet when I asked. Awesome manager opens the window. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Not until I get my money back from your stupid employees and that tiny jerk gets fired. Manager. Fired for what? She told me to buzz off. Manager. OP, is this true? Sister. Of course not. Entitled dad. It's true. Check your cameras. Manager. Fine. But I must ask you to leave the drive through You're holding up the line. Entitled Dad yells again and speeds into the parking lot, leaving his kids in the car and storming inside. Manager. Are you sure you didn't? Me. Of course not. Manager, you know me. Entitled Dad comes inside, his face contorting with rage as he spots me cleaning up the mess he made. That little jerk called me names. Manager. I highly doubt that. But since you kindly asked, sarcasm. We can check the cameras. Awesome manager checks the cameras and sees Entitled Dad throwing stuff at my sister and sees my customer service smile as I told Entitled Dad to buzz off. I did not call him names. But since I was smiling and manager can't read lips to save his life, he takes mine and sister's side and asks Entitled Dad to pay to have sister's uniform replaced. Heck no, she messed up my order. Manager, I can clearly see you throwing things at her. Of course, we could press charges if sister wishes. Sister had been cleaning herself up in the bathroom, so I take a guess as to what she'd want. Me. She isn't very confrontational, so I think she'll settle for you paying the damages. Nobody asked you. Me. Manager, I changed my mind. I think after seeing Entitled Dad's attitude toward her sister, my sister would love to press charges. Entitled Dad. My brother is a lawyer. I'll have your entire restaurant closed down. Manager whispering to me. OP, did you get Entitled Dad's plates? Me. I wrote them down as soon as he started getting nasty. Entitled Dad. What are you whispering about? I'll get both of you fired. Manager. Sir, I'm going to ask you again to leave or I will call the police. Fine. Your restaurant is nasty anyways. Entitled Dad storms out. I gave Awesome Manager the napkin I wrote the license plates down on and manager stays in the office to call the cops. Sister did not want to press charges like I predicted, but we were both allowed to go home early. I stayed to help coworker in the drive through until the rush died down and left with sister after. Since her pants were ruined, I bought her a new pair at Walmart before we went home. 
This took place shortly before sister went back to college and I started college after the summer. So I still don't know if Entitled Dad ever got justice. Usually when telling this story in real life, I embellish the ending with a court battle in which Entitled Dad gets totally owned. But unfortunately, that didn't actually happen. A person can dream though. What's your favorite flavor of Coke, if you know what I mean? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got Entitled Parent Tries Taking Disabled Mother's Parking Spot Gets Humiliated Okay, so this story happened something like 20 years ago, so my memory of the exact details are somewhat hazy. My mother has multiple sclerosis, and over the almost 30 years since she was diagnosed, it has taken her ability to walk. Today she needs a wheelchair just to get around the house and sometimes has trouble transferring from the wheelchair to her armchair or bed. But this event took place back when she could still get by with a wheeled walking frame over short distances and only needed a wheelchair if it involved extended distances, such as, for instance, doing the weekly shop at the local supermarket. I can't remember exactly how old I was when this happened, but it must have been before I got my driver's license, as I was sitting in the passenger seat when this happened. I was going shopping with my mom so I could push the trolley and do any heavy lifting while she got around in her wheelchair. We arrived at the supermarket and only the very last disabled parking bay was free. Not a problem as we only needed one. The car park was very clearly laid out and marked as being one way, meaning that you were expected to go the long way around if you missed a bay, which is why we were surprised when we encountered a car coming the other way, trying to get into the same parking space. Cue classic two cars, one space scene. We've all been there. Windows are rolled down so my mother and the other driver can discuss what's happening. I will be paraphrasing due to not remembering the exact wording. Entitled parent. That's my space. Mom. You came the wrong way. Entitled parent. I know, but I need that space for my daughter. I look over and there's a baby seat in the back of the other car. Mom. Is your daughter disabled? No. Mom. Then you need to use the family bays. The supermarket had more family bays than it had disabled bays, so they were just a little further from the doors. Entitled parent, those are too far to walk with my kid. Mom, well, at least you can walk. This line I remember perfectly. Now my mother has never been one to use her disability as an excuse. Even today, she tries to do as much as she possibly can for herself, but she is not one to stand by and let people sideline or take advantage of her because of it. Entitled parent turns a truly wonderful shade of green, my mother's words having cut through her defenses and scored a critical hit. She backs up and makes her way over to the family bays, allowing us to park in peace. While we were in the supermarket, I happened to catch a glimpse of Entitled Parent as she pushed her daughter around in a trolley. She saw my mom in her wheelchair and did a quick 180 and walked off, appropriately ashamed of her previous actions. I like to think that maybe we stopped her from turning into a full Karen that day. Next we've got, Entitled Parent Thinks I Work at Wonderworks and Demands I Turn Down the Volume. Backstory. Me and my family decided to go down to Myrtle Beach, it's on the east coast of the US for everyone who doesn't know, for vacation. Now Myrtle Beach is kinda like a tourist attraction, hence why it has Wonderworks. And for those of you who don't know what Wonderworks is, it's basically like a mini amusement park with tons of science experiments and stuff inside. Anyway, they have a wind tunnel so you can see how fast winds are going in a hurricane. But this particular entitled parent and her kid didn't like how loud the wind tunnel was. So on to the story. Wind tunnel starts up. Entitled parent shouting over the fans. Can you turn the volume down? I have a headache. Me also shouting over the fans. The door is right next to you. You can leave if it's too loud. Entitled Kid starts bawling, but I couldn't hear him. Look what you did. You made Entitled Kid cry. Wind tunnel starts to stop. Me, starting to lower my voice. I'm pretty sure the fans are what made him cry. Entitled Parent, still thinking the fans are on. You made him cry. I told you to turn down the fans. Some of you might be thinking that I work there, but nope, she somehow thought I was working there. Anyway, me. First of all, I don't work here. And I told you the door was right next to you. The employee running the wind tunnel comes over. Employee. What seems to be the problem? Your employee didn't turn down the volume on the wind tunnel. Yes, she said that. Employee. First of all, he doesn't work for us. And the wind tunnel is at a set speed. Lies. I want him fired. Again, 
It doesn't work for us. I will get all of you fired. Points to everyone in the wind tunnel. Mass confusion. Entitled parent, screaming nonsense while she walks out the exit. Employee. Sorry, everyone. Some people may have a screw loose. Me. Still trying to process what happened. I'm going to go to a different experiment thing. Luckily, entitled parent or her kid didn't come back, and I had a fun time there. And for you people who want to go to Wonderworks, it's expensive. $30 for one adult, $20 for a kid, and three and under get in free. Anyway, hope all of you liked this story and have a good day. Next we've got, and all because of a keyboard. I was in Walmart in the electronics section looking for a new keyboard. I am a klutz and spilled my coke on the keyboard and of course keys began to stick finally shorting out. As I checked out the keyboards checking the prices, a somewhat elderly gentleman stood next to me. He was looking at the various styles and prices. He asked what the difference was between two keyboards and I told him one is just for everyday use and the other was geared more for gamers. He asked me why some are RGB backlit. I said, it must be for aesthetics or something. Some gamers treat their PCs like they are classic cars. They are souped up with the latest tech. There are a couple of keyboards here that are backlit, so the lettering on the keys don't fade over time. I'm no expert in electronics. It's best if you ask a sales rep. The gentleman thanked me and found a sales rep. I picked up my keyboard and headed to the register when I heard a voice. Excuse me, I have been waiting 20 minutes for you to finish. I said, Impossible, I've only been here for five minutes. Well, that's neither here nor there. Help me with this television. It has a picture of Netflix on it. Does Netflix come free when you buy it? I said, no, probably not. That's false advertising. If it has Netflix on the box, it should be free. I said, well, ma'am, you should email or call the television manufacturer or Netflix and suggest it. Well, it has Netflix on the box. I am buying this television. I should get it free. Ma'am, there is nothing I can do for you except tell you to get a Netflix account. I'm not too tech savvy when it comes to smart TVs. Then it dawned on me. She thought I worked there. No wonder you only sell keyboards. You're not that bright. Then I uttered those magic words that has me posting here again. Ma'am, you misunderstood. I don't work here. That gentleman I was talking to was asking my advice. And with that, the floodgates opened. The accusations of not wanting to help her and being lazy. I didn't try to interrupt her. I let her go on her mindless rant all the while a crowd had filtered around us. Ma'am, are you done? Look at me. I'm in dirty jeans, high tops, and a pink Floyd t-shirt, along with my winter coat. Since when is this standard issue for a Walmart employee? I spoke softly because I learned the best way to get someone's attention is talk softly so they will quiet down to hear you. Ma'am, if you continue with this attitude, these people will think you are a serious threat to me and them and maybe even yourself. So please just calm down and try to comprehend these words. I do not work here. I am going to talk to you slow so these words sink in. She heard a few giggles and turned around and got a look at the people staring at her. She stopped like a deer caught in the headlights. Some smirked. Some just shook their head in disbelief. A grown woman would act this way. The woman walked away, humiliated. I tried to be polite about it, but there is only so much a person can take. As she left, the crowd left. I went to the register with my keyboard in hand. The cashier said she felt sorry for me and she would be unemployed for slugging her. I just paid for my keyboard, shrugged it off and said, some people, you know. And so here I am with a new keyboard and a new post. Side note, I don't call her Karen because I have a sister named Karen and she is far from being the internet meme Karen. Karen the thief gets caught and now she's in jail. So I'm from the UK. So a store we have here is Asta, which is basically a small Walmart. I had just done some midweek shopping to top up on some essentials, which included some toiletries. Most notably for this story, shower gel. I am in the car park outside the store when a woman pulls in. My Karen sensors were going crazy at this point. It's like she had won the Karen bingo in terms of looks and posture. She gets out of her car with her son, who is about three or four, and spies on me and my clear plastic bag with shower gel showing through, and immediately runs to me so fast I can see her outline in smoke beside her car. Karen, excuse me, what is that in your bag? Me, 
Uh, messages? In Scotland, we call groceries messages. It's weird, but who cares? Karen. Well, I just spotted that bath soap. She actually said that, and was wondering if I could get a look at it. The Karen alarms are going off at this point. Me. Why? It's in there. Third aisle. Karen. Oh, it's just to see the brand. I've never seen that one before. I show her the bottle, but hold on to it when she tries to snatch it like a wig. Oh, come on. I can't even see the name that far away. Give it here, now. Now I've been on this subreddit for a while now, so everything in my body was telling me I was getting a story. In my twisted head, I decided to have a little fun. So I started walking towards the shop again since I knew she would start a fuss and I needed witnesses for this. Me. How could you see it in my bag from your car then if you can't see it from two feet away? Karen. Oh, I had different glasses. These don't let me see close up well. So come on, hand it over. Another reach for the bottle. Another step away. She nearly fell over on her son and I had to use all my might to not burst into tears laughing. Me. Well, you wanted to hold it? I'm sorry, I had no clue. I hand her the bottle. For reference, we are now about 10 feet from the entrance. Karen. Oh, look at that. I can read it now. See, we could have avoided that whole thing if you weren't so dumb. And with that, in true Karen style, she slowly, while still trying to distract me with small talk about my day, slides the bottle in her bag. Honestly, she deserves some applause for such a stunt. Me. Uh, why did you just put that in your bag? Karen suddenly looking shocked. Oh, well, I assumed since you were about to buy all of those, points to bag, which contains three items worth less than five pounds. You could afford another one of these so I could get this one. You must understand how hard it is for a single mom to survive without donations. I can't get work, so this would mean so much. Wow, okay, she's going full wacko. This is definitely going to be a keeper. Me. I don't think that's how it works. You see, money is earned by working, and you spend the money on items that are yours. You don't steal. Am I getting through to you? Yes, I did the air quotes and explained this to her like the three-year-old she was standing beside. Suffice to say, this set her off. Karen. You insolent boy. How dare you talk to me that way? I just needed a simple piece of aid as a single mother. And this is how you treat me? With that, she turns to walk into the store, hitting me with her arm and bag. Enough to knock me off balance, but forgot two things. One, she has shower gel in her purse without a receipt. And two, I had some free time on my hands and a head for vengeance. Would it be fair to say that I stood at the entrance slash walked around the aisles a bit waiting for Karen? her son, and her stolen goods to hit the register? Yes, yes it would be. One thing to be noted was that the toiletries aisle was in disrepair, and so, as I noticed on my way around the store, had no camera or CCTV. You can probably see where I'm going now. Karen is walking to the register with some sweets, I assume for her son. It's go time. I calmly notify security that I may have seen that woman putting some shower gel in her bag, they thank me and watch her going to leave when they stop her. Security. Sorry, miss, but we have reason to believe that you have stolen merchandise. May we please see inside your bag? Karen. What? I haven't done such a thing. You can't see in my bag. I want to give this woman an Oscar at this point. Security. If you haven't stolen anything, then open your purse and we'll see nothing and you'll be free to go. Karen, as if suddenly remembering about the shower gel. No. Under no circumstances can you see in here. Security then calls the police. I even thought this was a bit much, but security said it's protocol. Police. Ma'am, we need to search your bag now. Failure to comply will result in punishment. Karen. Okay, fine. Here. She hands over the bag, then immediately spots me by some clothes. Here she catches escape plan B. Karen. Officers, that boy over there may have put something in my bag. He was hanging around and harassing me and my son the whole time I was in the shop. Officers call me over. I basically say, heck no, and they find the shower gel. Karen, see? He's trying to frame me. The one you want is right there. 
A store clerk informs the officer that the CCTV in the toiletries aisle is broken, so the police are about to leave and let the store deal with the two of us, as there is no evidence, when part three of my plan comes to light. Remember when I said that I moved Karen to the front of the store, where CCTV is present? Me. Actually, I had a confrontation with Karen in front of the store that may explain this whole thing. Can we please check the footage, officers? I swear, I saw a vein in Karen's head pop, as she realized that she was in deep trouble. With that, she ran directly at me, like a bull seeing red, leaving her son standing there, just saying, I'm a pretty skinny guy, so I was about to scream when, once again, my brain saved me. What was this expert plan? I stepped to the left a bit. Karen kept going. She ran straight into a register, immediately got winded, and kind of just stood there, glaring at me. Her face was redder than a tomato, and I just had a slight smirk on my look of surprise. We checked the cameras while Karen was put in a police car. Sure enough, the whole confrontation was plainly visible. She's now getting jail time for taking a bottle of shower gel. Me 1, Karen minus 2. Edit. Some context as to why Karen got jailed, as far as I was told. She apparently had caused some trouble in the store before. Antisocial behavior, an employee told me. So the police already had history dealing with her. She seemed quite unhinged, so this made sense. I understand that this is honestly quite unbelievable, but I'll answer any questions you have with the limited knowledge of her history in the area. Next we've got, I wouldn't let entitled mom's kid pet a snake. This fun little story happened while I was interning at a zoo this past summer. One of my tasks was to take an animal, in my case a ball python named Kipira, to a designated spot and talk about her. These were called animal encounters. After being trained to do them with one of my supervisors, I could do them by myself. If I felt comfortable during the encounter, I could let people touch the animal. The only requirement is that I bring hand sanitizer. This particular time, I forgot the hand sanitizer. We also have to have a radio on us at all times. This I did not forget. It was my second to last day and things were a little hectic in the department I was interning at. So off I went on my encounter. We've got me, we've got entitled mom, we've got her kid around four or five, and we've got security. Me, talking to a small crowd of about 10. Kid, playing behind me, then realizes I have a live snake in my hands. He runs up to me and reaches for Kipira. I raise my arms to my chest level and out of his reach. He was really excited and honestly it was really cute. That reaction was one of the many reasons I loved doing this task of my internship. Enter entitled mom, rounding the area her son was playing in. Me, sorry bud, we're not going to touch the snake today. Addressing him and the small audience, do you guys know what kind of snake entitled mom? Why can't he just pet the dang thing? You're holding it. Me, well, we aren't going to touch Kapira today since I don't have any hand sanitizer to clean everyone's hands with today. Still cheery, despite the attitude this entitled mom is giving me and my heart pounding. I'm not afraid to stand my ground, but confrontation gives me stupid amounts of anxiety. This is a ball python, and she entitled mom digging through her purse. Well, I have some hand sanitizer right here. So here, let him touch the stupid thing. Her kid, still really excited, still jumping for the snake I'm now holding at shoulder level. Me. Well, it wouldn't really be fair if this little man got to pet the snake and no one else could, right? But if you stick around, you'll learn lots of cool facts about Kipira and other snakes like her. Addressing the audience again. What kind of food do you guys think she eats? Entitled mom. We paid good money to be here. And you're going to bring this thing out and not even let my son pet it? Part of my ticket includes an animal encounter and he wants to pet it. So just let him already. Me. Well, the animal encounter you paid for is for a specific animal. If you want, I can show you where you're supposed to meet your guide. Unfortunately, the animal I have is not part of that program. I'm trying not to let my voice crack or tears leave my eyes at this point. Entitled Mom. Just let him pet the stupid animal before I snatch it from your arms and let him pet it myself. Me. I close my eyes and take a deep breath. Then I ignore Entitled Mom and her kid who's still jumping all over me like I'm some kind of jungle gym, completely. I heard you guys say that she eats mice, and you would be totally right. 
How do y'all think she's able to eat them without arms and legs though? Entitled mom yanks her kid away from me by the arm and now he's at meltdown level temper tantrum. She storms off and my heart rate begins to slow, thankfully. About 10 minutes later, me. When she sheds, her skin comes off all in one piece, even the skin on her eyeballs. Crazy, right? Entitled mom. That's her. I whip around to see Entitled Mom, her kid, and two security guards in tow. My heart drops to my feet, and I think to myself that this is the end of such a great internship. Security. Hey, how's it going? Me. Great, is everything okay? I didn't hear anything on the radio. I tell the audience that I have to put the snake away and that they were great to talk to. I put Kapira safely and securely in her transport cooler. Entitled Mom. You're not going to make her give you that dangerous animal? Security. You're not part of herpetology, right? That isn't a venomous animal. Me. No, I work in this department, and this isn't a venomous snake at all. Why? Entitled mom screaming at the second security guard for not escorting me out and banning me. Her kid pretty much silent crying. His face was so red and smeared with snot and tears that I really did feel bad for him. Security. All right. How about you go head back to your building and we'll take care of this guest. Before the end of the day, maybe two hours later, the same security guard swung by and got a statement from me. He sat down with me and my supervisor and told us entitled mom's side of the story. Apparently, she marched up to the security building near the main entrance yelling about a deranged employee that let a poisonous snake bite her kid. An on-site EMT looked all over him and found no evidence of any kind of bite. Then they let Entitled Mom lead them to me. He said they took care of her and that I won't face any disciplinary actions since they also got a couple statements from the two or three guests that saw the whole interaction. I don't know what happened to Entitled Mom or her kid. I'd imagine she was removed from the property and possibly banned. But the rest of my internship was amazing. Do you like snakes or are you afraid of them? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got... Post office refuses to take competitor's package, Karen completely loses it. I, a mail carrier, was filling in on another carrier's route one day. On this route is a small business owned by a Karen. Not her real name, obviously, but you get the idea. Karen ships items with us, FedEx, and UPS, whatever her customer prefers. This is understandable. Customer wants, customer gets. The full-time carrier on this route had left notes for anyone filling in and as a reminder to himself to check each item out going, because Karen apparently has no idea that the USPS, FedEx, and UPS are entirely separate entities and will just put all of her outgoing packages in one big pile. So I see the note to check, and I do. Mixed in with the stuff for USPS are two small packages that are next day air for FedEx, so I take them out and put them aside for the FedEx guy. Karen sees this. Karen is upset by this, so I explain to her that while we do have a system in place to get FedEx items back to FedEx, that it will only slow the items down and likely cause her customers to not receive them on time. Karen listens to all of this, fumes silently for a few seconds and says, I demand you take these packages. It does not matter that she is wrong. She is in charge, dang it, and I do as she says. I stare at her for an equal amount of time conscious of the fact that my hat, jacket, shirt, and bag all bear the logo of the United States Post Service and not FedEx, waiting for the punchline. As it turns out, Karen is the punchline, so I explain again, using very small words, that I would be doing her and her customers a disservice by taking those packages. She tells me she'll have my job, showing that she has no idea how union workplaces function and issues her demand again, to which I say, no, take the packages and letters with proper postage and continue upon the route. 15 minutes later, I get a call from my supervisor. Karen has called to complain that I would not take the outgoing packages. I tell my supervisor I have seven parcel pickups from her and only left behind the stuff that wasn't ours. Supervisor says, oh, okay, and I figure that is the end of it. I get back to the office that evening and several of the clerks and the supervisor are laughing their butts off. Unsatisfied by the supervisor's reiteration of the fact that the United States Post Service is not Federal Express, Karen has come in to lodge her complaint in person and demand again that we handle her FedEx packages. 
Upon being told no, she has launched into a screaming fit, left a scathing Google Maps review of that particular post office, then stormed out, leaving behind the two packages in question. They sat on a shelf for over a week before a FedEx employee could come to pick them up. After I am told, she called that post office and demanded a refund because it was not delivered on time. Next we've got the time a 50-year-old man threw his transaction items at me. We've got angry customer and we've got nice customer. This happened over the summer of 2018 when I worked as a cashier at a large home improvement company. They had really good benefits and bonuses, which is why I stayed for almost a full year. I enjoyed most of the customers, but this story is one of many as to why I quit and left retail altogether. A bit of backstory. My store's cashier setup used to be a row of tills, and then in the self-checkouts, there was also a till. So pretty much, the person who was stuck at this till would ring customers up and have to maintain the self-checkouts. This caused a lot of stress as honestly, our self-checkouts were not good and broke down constantly. So when we were busy, it was a nightmare. To alleviate this problem, they took out the till and left the self-checkouts. We still rang people through the self-checkouts using our scanners and bagging their items whenever possible. I still don't think they anticipated the backlash this caused, and whatever your opinion is on self-checkouts, the behavior that followed was not okay. For the first several months after this change, the amount of people that would yell at us and spit at us and had us call managers so they could yell at them was honestly mind-blowing to me especially since all they had to do was use the pin pad, since we would typically still scan and bag their items for them to provide excellent customer service. They also would now always keep another till open. Before, you would often be working alone with a till and all four self-checkouts. Then when they switched it over, they decided to keep an extra till open just for customers who preferred tills. Now onto the main story. This happened after the things had begun settling down with the self-checkouts, there had been no till for several months now, and most people knew. We still scanned in larger purchases for customers, but overall, everyone scanned their own items. This gentleman, around 50, walks up to my counter and places the items down on it. I smile and greet him and inform him that I'm no longer a till, but I'd be happy to assist him and ring him through the self-checkouts. Angry customer grumbles at me, eh? Sure, whatever. I bring his items to the self-checkout and I begin scanning all his items, making small talk. We get to the end of the purchase and all he has left to do is insert his card into the chip reader. I had completed everything for him up until that point and he lost it on me, saying he didn't want to use the stupid self-checkout, it's too complicated, take me to a till. I calmly explained to him that all he needed to do was present his card and follow the instructions on the pin pad and that all the pin pads for the SCOs and the tills were the exact same. I also told him that there was a till right beside me he could go to if he was more comfortable with that. I could see him getting more aggravated, but the other SCOs needed my attention, so I left him to decide if he wanted to pay or wait in line for a till. Then I came back to him. He had his arms crossed and a smirk on his face. He told me gleefully, I'm not paying. Um, what? His items totaled between $100 and $200. I explained to him that I couldn't do that for free, but I could offer a discount for his troubles. We were allowed to offer discounts of up to $50, something about empowering ourselves. He repeated that he wasn't paying and I couldn't make him. I asked him again to pay or I would need to cancel his order as other people were waiting to use the self-checkouts. He told me to cancel his order. So that's what I did. I hit cancel. It flashed on his screen and he grabbed his items off the self-checkout bench and threw them at me, storming out. The nice customer behind him helped me pick up everything, muttering about what a baby the angry customer was. And since nice customer was so nice, I gave him a discount instead. I went and talked to my manager afterwards about what happened, but they had gotten so used to this behavior, they just shrugged it off. I quit not too long after that, as I had a job offer come through that was in the field I wanted to be in. Do you like using self-checkouts, or do you like having a cashier ring you up? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got, what it was like to nanny for an upper class family. I was a nanny for over three years for a family that consisted of a married couple with three kids. They were by far the laziest and most self-entitled parents that I've ever known, especially the mother. She had an it's-all-about-me personality, 
She also had a negative remark for just about everyone, mainly on their appearance. Made me wonder what she said about me when I wasn't around. Honestly, she absolutely could have been a stay-at-home mom, but I 100% believe that she only worked to get away from her kids. They never got their kids up for school. An alarm clock did that. I had to get up at 5 a.m. when I lived 45 minutes away to get their daughter ready for school just so they could sleep in another hour or so. I made meals, did household chores, ran errands such as grocery shopping, and even went school supply shopping, Christmas shopping, etc. I worked all holidays, with the exception of Thanksgiving and Christmas, just so they could sleep in until noon and not have to deal with their kids. However, when they got older and they were allowed iPads, I got most holidays off, unpaid of course, because the iPad would entertain them while their parents slept. Even when I got pregnant and I had the baby, I was still doing most of these things. The kid's grandma who lived downstairs in the in-laws suite did a lot of work with the kids too, with making dinner several times per week, reading stories before bed, watching them some weekends when they wanted to go out and party. I never understood that, especially considering their age. It didn't help that I was severely underpaid compared to the other nannies in the area, but I loved the kids, so I made it work. After I had my son, I got handed a piece of paper with my new hours. Basically, it was a lot of driving around to three different schools, going home for a few hours, then going to two different schools to pick up kids and to the bus stop to get the oldest. This was never a sit-down discussion to make sure I'd be okay with this, especially with a new baby. The mom also took it upon herself via text to inform me that I would no longer be getting paid one of my two weeks of vacation because I was part-time now, according to her, and that was a full-time benefit. I was still working 35 hours per week, an average, which in the state I live in, it's considered full-time. So mind you, it was their brilliant idea to let me continue to work after having my baby. They told me that I could bring him knowing that newborns require a lot of attention. Nothing went undone. I still did all of what I listed above and some despite having a newborn. That didn't matter to them because the minute my baby was having a bad day, he had colic. I got extreme lip for not playing dolls with their four-year-old. The mom said, and I quote, My kids are number one priority over him. Him, meaning my son. I was floored over the lack of compassion, though I shouldn't have been. This is the same mom who tells her kids that they're the reason she hates coming home, giving them an iPad for all hours of the morning so she can sleep in, yells at her oldest for getting a B in math when math isn't her strongest subject, and shows blatant favoritism towards her youngest, the one I got chewed out over. She knows he had stomach issues. She knew he was a newborn. She didn't care. I called my husband on the way home crying. He told me to drop the baby off, go back and give them a two-week notice. He told me that it's clear that they need me more than I need them. Between the way she said what she said and how she handled my hours and vacation time, enough was enough. I got a series of texts from the mom begging me to reconsider and that I am a great nanny who is the whole package, blah, blah, blah. I stuck to it, worked my two week notice and didn't look back. Grandma was mad at me for not reconsidering and talking with them. Why should I? I was basically denied a conversation about my new hours, new responsibilities and vacation time. I didn't owe them a darn thing. She was likely mad because she probably inherited a lot of my responsibilities. It brings me so much happiness knowing that they messed up and that they're suffering because now they actually are being forced to be parents. I would also like to add that about eight months before I got pregnant with my son, I was shocked to find that I was pregnant 100% naturally when I had what was at the time unexplained infertility. We later found out it was PCOS. She made it very clear that she wasn't happy with the pregnancy and questioned everything the doctor said about my pregnancy. She didn't believe that I was pregnant with twins and also didn't believe it when they told me I had a subchorionic hemorrhage and that it could end in a miscarriage. I was terrified of losing a pregnancy that was a miracle in the first place and she literally screamed at me and told me, it's not that serious. You're not the first person to ever be pregnant. Chill out. I just started bawling right there and she stormed upstairs and slammed her door. She came down 15 minutes later and started talking to me like nothing had happened. I was still upset, so she only got one-worded answers. Then she had the nerve to ask me what was wrong with me. I literally went off on her about how her reaction was uncalled for, and she told me that I was stressing her out and that she can't deal with it. I replied with, are you serious right now? You're stressed? What about what I'm going through? 
Regardless of if the doctor is wrong or right, I don't need that from you. She later apologized, but surely enough, two weeks later, it was indeed a miscarriage and was indeed twins. Even after my loss, she kept nonchalantly telling me to hold off on kids, that her insurance was so messed up after her birth that she almost got postpartum depression, kids are a huge responsibility, and that I had my whole life ahead of me. I'm glad I didn't listen, because with my condition, it isn't easy getting pregnant. My boy is one now, and he's my world. I couldn't imagine doing anything differently. I wanted to quit after the heated exchange, and quite frankly, I should have. I really did love those kids though. I felt like they needed consistency in their lives, and I felt as if no one could care for them like I could. At the end of the day, it wasn't about me anymore. I had to move on with my life for the sake of my son. I never realized how toxic the situation was from start to finish until I decided to separate myself from it. I'm proud to say that I landed a new job my last day on the old job. I got employee of the month within five months of working there and get told daily how appreciated I am and it truly shows. So Karen, what did you think of today's stories? They were horrible. Horrible? How dare you? These were some of the best we've ever read. Oh shut up Mr. Reddit. It's ridiculous what people like myself have to go through. Dealing with stupid people like yourself and your subscribers. Look Karen. You can say whatever you want about me, but don't you talk about my re-army. Tch, re-army. Most of your viewers aren't even subscribed to your channel. 70% if I'm correct. Well, I can't argue with that. That's true. Most, most of my viewers don't actually subscribe for some reason. It's because you're stupid, Mr. Reddit. No, I'm not. All right, guys, let's prove Karen wrong by making sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on notifications. Pah, they're not going to listen to you. And if you'd like me or Karen what? to record a special message for you, come visit me on Fiverr, link pinned in the comments below. Never! And join as a channel member today, and Karen will give you a special shout out in the next video. Like heck I will!